On uh, behalf of Council, I want to uh, welcome Dr. Aaron Spence, our Superintendent of Schools, and members of the School Board and his staff for the uh, initial presentation. So, Mr. Manager, if we can proceed. Well, we are uh, resuming, uh, Mayor, members of Council, uh, we are resuming our FY20 operating budget briefings, and okay. we're pleased to say, School Board, welcome. And okay. uh, if I can just, uh, you know, uh, say one thing. Uh, before Mr. Moss and Ms. Abbott are going to be running late, uh, and Mr. Rouse. And, uh, but the other thing is, too, we had uh, the city of Virginia Beach had a loss with Father Jim Park, uh, who passed on. And let me just say that, you know, between all the, uh, the various functions he served in our volunteer office with the Human Rights Commission and everything, he was a very valuable and passionate and compassionate individual. And uh, we pray for him and his loved ones and, you know, profound thanks on behalf of the city because this is the type of individual that helps make Virginia Beach such a great place. He will be sorely missed. And thank you for the interruption. Thank so, you. So, Chairwoman Anderson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Dyer, council members, and Mr. Hansen. I'm pleased to present the Virginia Beach City Public Schools proposed budget for fiscal year 2019-2020. Our $790 million operating budget showcases the range of needs our school division has throughout the year. In order for us to continue to be on the cutting edge in our classrooms and to address important operational issues, this budget outlines funding to support expanding full day kindergarten, continue our technology initiative, compensate our staff competitively, and puts an emphasis on school safety and behavioral interventions. This budget also helps us remain focused on improving special education services. This chart shows the breakdown of the school operating fund, which totals $789.5 million. <clears throat> As you see here, local funding is at 50.9% and is our largest funding source. State basic aid and state sales tax are the second largest funding sources at 46.3%, with the other sources, including federal funding, at 2.8%. Another way to break down the budget pie is by major category. As you would expect, the instructional slice is the largest at 75.4%. Operations and maintenance is at 11.8%. People transportation is at 5%. Technology is at 4.5%. And lastly, administration and attendance and health is at 3.3%. It is important to note here that these specific categories are dictated by the Virginia Department of Education. Here is the last pie chart, and this chart shows the expenditure by type. We are a labor-intensive business, as you can see. Combining our personal services or salaries with the fringe benefits totals just over 84% of our total expenditures. The rest of the other pieces equal the other 16%, and most of that 16% is non-discretionary meaning only a small portion of the 16% allows for any flexibility. For more than a decade, VBCPS has been recognized as an excellent example of sound budgeting practices in school governance. Collectively, we consistently work to ensure we are good stewards of this community's investment in our schools, as well as that the community receives a return on its investment. As you know, <clears throat> VBCPS continues to be one of the best school systems in the state and arguably the nation, and that is something to be proud of. We continue to excel in a, as a division despite significant challenges, including dramatic reductions in state funding that have never been fully restored since 2009. That reduction has negatively impacted our ability to be competitive as it relates to teacher salaries. And this issue is one that 
is an extremely important issue to our school board and administration. According to recent data compiled by the Virginia Municipal League, instructional pay increases have slowed considerably statewide since 2009 when the recession hit. And out of 50 states, Virginia now ranks 32nd in average teacher salaries. Northern Virginia pays significantly more than the rest of the state. So if you take their pay out of the equation, Virginia drops into the bottom five states of teacher pay. What's even more concerning is that data compiled by the National Center for Education Statistics points to a significant national pay gap between teachers and other college graduates, with Virginia having the largest pay gap of any state at nearly 40%. This discussion should be of concern to us all as we face a growing teacher shortage at the national, state, and local levels. That said, on behalf of the school board, I want to thank all of you for taking on more than your fair share of the budget for VBCPS. I want to be sure to acknowledge the financial investment that you and our community continue to make locally. As you can see here, the burden for funding of our schools has shifted since 2009, when the majority of funding came from state and federal dollars. <clears throat> Today, the majority of funding comes from local dollars. You stepped up for us. You've come forward for us. We appreciate that. Our community continues to invest in our schools and rightfully expects excellence from our schools. Despite the physical challenges I just mentioned, our staff and students have flourished. I am proud to say that all our schools are accredited for the second year in a row. Our on-time graduation rate hit a record 93.3%, and we also saw our lowest drop ever dropout rate at 3.8%. Across the board, we have seen monumental gains in advanced placement scores and the number of career certifications earned by our students. Now, I'm going to walk through the overarching priorities outlined in this budget. While there are several key priorities for the school board, the first thing I want to address is the acceleration of implementing full day kindergarten. As educators, we know the benefits of full day kindergarten. By providing a solid foundation of learning to children from all backgrounds, full day kindergarten programs ensure all students academic, social and emotional success. Another reason we are asking for funding to expand full day kindergarten to all but three schools next year is so that monies for kindergarten will not compete with our ability to increase teacher compensation in 2020. I want to address directly the idea of using reversion funds for full day kindergarten because for some reason this is an idea that keeps coming up from people that I hear about. And I want to ensure that the community understands why that would be physically irresponsible. The school division and other organizations like ours do not spend their budgets down to the last penny, ever. It is reckless to do so. Reversion funds are one-time funds that are be to be used for one-time purchases, such as buses or HVAC systems, not to sustain ongoing initiatives. Our school division uses sound fiscal budgeting and accounting practices. And as is the case with most government entities, we won't typically spend all of the revenue allotted. We generally, generally leave about 2% of the funds available in case of unexpected expenses, such as repairs to facilities because of catastrophic weather events or even an increase in gas prices. We've been lucky for the past few years that the gas prices have dropped. And so to hear people say that, oh, you had all this money left over, well, we haven't had a catastrophic event. Gap, gas prices have been low. Those are some of the reasons. Therefore, it is unacceptable and misleading to the public to state that reversion funds would be a good solution to fund all day kindergarten. 
I believe it is important to note that since fiscal year 2009 and 2010, we have been forced to use reversion funds to balance the following year's operating fund budgets. This budget balancing strategy was used during the recession to keep VBCPS from having to resort to more drastic budget balancing measures, such as a reduction in force, cutting a significant number of programs, no pay raises over a significant number of years, or furloughs, et cetera. And we have acknowledged over the years that this budget balancing strategy is a structural flaw in our annual budgeting process. In more recent years, we have made specific efforts to reduce our reliance on reversion funds to balance future budgets, which is another reason that funding full day kindergarten this way is not a good strategy. Therefore, asking you for the additional $4.85 million to fund the remainder of schools for full day kindergarten is necessary and will allow us to provide equity and the same opportunity for students in all our school communities. These additional funds will complete our request for the funding of full day kindergarten for the entire city and we won't have to come back and ask for that, those funds anymore. Another priority of the school board and administration is safety and security upgrades in our schools. We also have put extra emphasis on social emotional development and safety in this budget. Our blue ribbon panel on school safety shared its recommendations with VBCPS and the school board last July. And we propose to continue the implementation of those recommendations. We have added additional behavior intervention specialists school psychologists, and elementary guidance counselors. We've also allocated funds to expand the Office of Safe Schools in order to meet the increasing needs of our 86 schools and centers and their security personnel. We know school safety is an ongoing issue nationally, and our proactive approach has been recognized at the state and national levels. You will also see in this budget an increased focus on special education. As a division, we have been actively working to improve our special education program and have recommended another program compliance support teacher, three additional special education teachers, and four additional special education teacher assistants. Furthermore, VBCPS recognizes the need for ongoing capital improvements. The proposed capital improvement plan, known as CIP, provides funding to complete the three school projects that are currently underway. The modernization of John B. Dye Elementary School and the replacement of both Thurgood Elementary and Princess Anne Middle Schools. There is also funding in the fiscal year 1920 budget to begin planning for the replacement of Princess Anne High School. This project is still not fully funded as 30% of the funding for the project remains outside of the six year CIP window. The same is true for the next replacement project, Betty F. Williams Elementary School and the Bayside sixth grade campus, a project that proposes to accommodate grades four through six in a model similar to the current Lansdowne Elementary and Middle School campus. This CIP continues to fund infrastructure projects such as roof and HVAC updates, but still falls short of making long-term progress with our long-range facility needs. It is important that we have a serious and thoughtful dialogue with our city leaders and our community if we hope to see real progress in this area. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Tony Arnold who will outline our current capital improvement plan. And I'll be available later for questions as well. Thank you, Chairwoman Anderson. Good afternoon, Mayor Dyer, members of council, Mr. Hanson, um, great to be with you. Um, the, the Chairwoman mentioned the, the three projects that we currently have under construction, if you've uh, driven down Great Neck Road, you'll see that uh, we've got an occupied modernization of John B. Dye that's about 75% complete. Uh, we'll finish up um, uh, late spring, early summer of 2020. Uh, we tore down Thurgood Elementary School uh, last summer. 
Uh, that project's about 30 percent complete. Uh, we'll also finish uh, in the summer of 2020. Um, and on Seaboard Road, uh, if you've uh, driven by there, you'll see that uh, we're, we're actually swinging a lot of steel, a lot of progress made toward that building down in an early demo package. Uh, that project will finish um, in the summer of 2021. Those, uh, those three projects represent an investment, as you see, of about $138 million. Um, you know, it, it is, it's always worth mentioning that, uh, um, you know, if you, you wind the clock back um, about two decades, that uh, <coughs> these buildings represent buildings 32, 33, and 34 in our uh, long-range uh, modernization and replacement plan. And so this community has invested north of three quarters of a billion dollars in replacing our older assets. So that's, uh, that's something we need to be mindful of. Uh, that represents uh, more than three and a half million square feet of space, uh, or about a third of our, our total inventory. So we have done an awful lot in the last two decades. So what else is in this capital program? Again, the, these top three projects are fully funded. Um, you heard the, the chairwoman, chairwoman mention that uh, um, we've got renovations and replacements projects, uh, re-roofing HVAC, all the infrastructure-related work we typically do between 15 and 20 million every summer uh, in infrastructure work. Uh, that's pretty well funded. We also uh, are continuing our energy performance contracts initiative with phase two, an additional 15 million. Uh, when we are done with our energy performance contracts projects, uh, we will have invested uh, Forty-four million dollars in reducing our uh, our energy footprint, um, and what does that mean to you in terms of real dollars? Uh, we have grown since 2006 on the order of about nine uh, percentage, uh, nine percent in terms of square footage of our inventory. Uh, we've torn down smaller buildings. We've built back buildings that are a little bit bigger. Over that same time period, we have reduced our energy consumption by on the order of 28 percent. Um, so, folks, that's a cost avoidance each and every year on the order of about $5 million, every year. Uh, so we have another uh, about $15 million in energy performance contracts projects that we'll do that will involve replacing um, old lighting with LED lighting, converting to uh, geothermal systems and other HVAC equipment related projects. It's a really, really good initiative. Uh, it improves the learning environment uh, and also saves us long-term operating dollars. Um, you'll see the Plaza Annex Office Edition. Uh, we're, we're in the process of designing a, uh, an addition to the back of the Plaza Annex. Uh, we will vacate the Laskin Road Annex, the old Lincoln Park School, um, at the end of 2020 uh, and consolidate our administrative functions into the, uh, the Plaza Annex. Uh, and we are currently working <clears throat> with your economic development team on, uh, on marketing that particular piece of property. Uh, similar to what we did with your economic development folks and the uh, 11 acres adjacent to uh, the Renaissance Academy, uh, that property is actually getting ready to close uh, and it is, will go, go back on the tax rolls and uh, will result in uh, 240 uh, apartments on Witch Duck Road. Uh, some playground equipment play, uh, replacement projects we partner with your parks and recreation folks on. Um, uh, the chairwoman mentioned Prince Anne High School replacement, uh, the next replacement project in our long-range facility study. Uh, you will see that 30 percent of the funding is, is hanging outside of the six-year window. Um, the earliest that this project could start, uh, and that's a tentative date, is 2023. Um, that is subject to slippage depending upon funding. Uh, and then the only other uh, replacement project in the program is the Betty F. Williams Bayside sixth grade campus. Uh, which uh, has a million dollars in year six. Uh, Councilwoman um, Wilson worked with us on the long range facilities plan. We spent the better part of the past year reaching out to the community um, and we identified the next 15 schools that are in need of either modernization or replacement. Uh, got great feedback from the community. Uh, the board accepted those findings last fall. Folks, there's a, there are a billion dollars worth of needs today on those 15 schools as we stand here right now. So in this capital program, you, the six-year program is uh, a little bit north of $400 million, including appropriations to date. Uh, year one uh, is just over $56 million. Uh, this represents the resource side um, of what the board adopted back on March the 5th. Um, year one, 1920, as you see, $56.7 million. Um, 
really the balance of the five years is on the order of about $40 million. Um, uh, a good rule of thumb for investing back in your infrastructure is 2 to 4 percent of the value of your, of your assets. And 2 percent of the value of the assets is, is on the order of about $85 million. So I think we all recognize that long term that we're going to need to do something uh, a little more aggressive in terms of some of our older assets. Uh, our four oldest high schools, Princess Anne, Kempsville, Bayside, and First Colonial, uh, the average age of those buildings is approaching 60 years old. So we do, uh, we do a great job of maintaining our infrastructure, um, but like anything else, as buildings get older and start to age, uh, you've got to invest more significantly in them. Uh, and finally, here's the, the funding summary that represents the project side of it. Uh, the only new project that you'll see is the project down at the bottom, the Betty F. Williams Bayside Sixth Grade Campus. Uh, it's a similar model as uh, the chairwoman mentioned of the Lansdowne Elementary and Middle School, where we consolidate, uh, uh, in this case, a, a four and five grade uh, elementary program together with sixth grade on one campus. Uh, saves um, in physical plant, uh, but again, only a million dollars of that project is funded out in year six. That completes the capital program. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Chairwoman Anderson to uh, facilitate any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions or comments? Mr. Wood. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> going back to the full day kindergarten, I just had a couple of questions. How were the schools selected for full day kindergarten? Dr. Spence, would you like to? comment on that? Sure. Thank you. Uh, we created a list of criteria that we weighed against the schools. It, it uh, essentially was based on um, student achievement primarily, and then there were some economic factors that were associated with that as well. So when I, when I look at this document that, that y'all were kind enough to provide, I don't know, maybe our, I don't know if our staff did it or if you guys did it, it kind of shows the, this breakdown, but it Geographically, it doesn't appear to be equally distributed around the city. For example, Kempsville has virtually every elementary school, has full day kindergarten. Um, Princess Anne has three, and all of theirs are pushed off. Lynn Haven, kind of the same thing. And I'm, I'm just curious about, yeah, about so that. Is, is any consideration given to geography? We, didn't, we did not give consideration to geography. Um, so, that, so obviously one of the primary purposes of getting full day kindergarten into place was for school readiness purposes. And so some of the student achievement data that we looked at included uh, reading data, so DRA and PALS data, and also student achievement data on the SOLs. And then uh, those, uh, those data really kind of informed the decision about where did we need more instruction for students. And so that, that informed that more than anything else, and there were, really wasn't a geographical consideration. So I was surprised. So does, does the Achievable Dream not have full-day kindergarten? No. They do. They're a Title I school. All of our Title I schools were funded with full-day kindergarten. It indicates on here that CTAC isn't in until 21. Right. And so let me try to explain. So Title I schools have full-day kindergarten. Currently, Title I is federal funding. Once the city is fully funded with, lo with local dollars for full-day kindergarten, local and state dollars for full-day kindergarten, we can no, no longer use federal dollars. So we'll have to remove those title dollars. And as we do that, we're adding them to our list of schools that need full funding from state and local dollars. So then these that are listed that are Title I going off to the future, they already have it. They have it today, but they won't be, we won't be able to pay for them with federal dollars, so we have to find funding for them locally. All right. Um, I'm getting a lot of phone calls from from people in the Lynn Haven District, primarily uh, Kingston and Trantwood parents who were very concerned about it because they're pushed all the way off to 21 or 22 on, on the current current schedule, and they, they feel that they should get the same thing as Arrowhead Indian Lakes, Kempsville, Kempsville Meadows, Providence, et cetera, but that, that's where that is. Um, walk me through the expenses and um, the changes and that sort of thing. What, what, what does it cost when when you say, okay, I'm going to turn Bird Deck Elementary School into full-day kindergarten, what do you have to do? What, where does the money go? So the primary cost is in personnel. So if you think about if you've got a teacher who's teaching two sections, a morning section and an afternoon section, and you go to full day, you're going to have two sections of kindergarten for full day now. And so the primary cost is personnel. 
And so, so you're doubling, essentially doubling your kindergarten workforce in any building that you're moving to full day kindergarten. And then there are some classroom modifications that need to take place in some instances. So for example, kindergarten classrooms will typically have a restroom in them and not all of ours do. And then there's some furniture needs that will be required as well. But Smaller furniture needed in some of those. Sorry? Do you have to add classrooms? Uh, no, we, we have space for them. I mean, so one of the one of the benefits to this has been that we have had space in our buildings. When we brought the original recommendation to expand to the board, we did a space survey and determined that um, essentially we could get that done in all of our buildings without actually adding additional classrooms in the CIP. Um, could, could I get this done correctly then showing the ones that are actually to have it, the Title I as well? Just. Okay, Jessica, then Rosemary. You mentioned DRA and SOL scores. Are you looking at um, the scores and DRA overall for the all for K through five, or are you looking at just the first SOL testing year? So, what well, the criteria you were for selecting the school? Right. So that so DRA data is available K through two mm -hmm. uh, typically, and that we don't administer that in every grade. After that, we only administer that for students who are struggling mm -hmm. readers. Um, that must be different than CTEC, because CTEC, well, they at least, I think my husband administers DRA every, for all his kids, but, but he's in fourth grade, so, but not all most of the schools don't do that. That's correct. Okay. Um, as far as the Title I funding, what is the estimate that we're going to lose from federal dollars? I don't have the exact number in front of me, but, um, Farrell, do you have a ballpark range on Title I funding that we're um, putting towards full-day kindergarten at the moment? I don't have it. We can get you that yes, information. For every teacher that's a Title I teacher, let's say salary and benefits of $75,000, we take that federal money out and we have to replace it with local right. state money. Are we losing any additional benefits for the Title I schools or is it just the federal dollars? So we're not actually losing the federal dollars. We, we can't use them for kindergarten. So it's essentially a, a, a part of the law for federal title dollar spending, which is called uh, supplanting. Mm -hmm. Which basically says whatever you do for all students, you cannot use Title I dollars to do for other for students who receive in schools who receive Title I funding. So Title I dollars are intended to level the playing field for students who are living in poverty, mm -hmm. and those schools are typically allocated to schools. Uh, those dollars are typically allocated to schools with high poverty uh, populations. But we will receive less. No, we'll keep the same amount of Title dollars available to us. But because we're offering full day kindergarten across the city, we can't use it for that purpose. We will reallocate it for different purposes. So some of the other things that title dollars can be used for would include things like instructional coaches, like math coaches, reading coaches, reading specialists that can work one-on-one -on -one with students. We can also use that for class size reduction in our high poverty schools. So there's a number of, of different things that we can do with title dollars. Uh, we just can't do, uh, again, the same for uh, gotcha. those schools as we do for all schools in the city. So the last question, I, I got a couple calls about it. Is there going to, what is the average kindergarten class size going to be? So uh, we actually, through the state, are under a class size reduction for kindergarten class sizes, and I think that number is at 19. That sounds, that's the other question I received from a couple teachers is, is there going to, for the kindergarten classes, is there going to be additional um, like teacher aids or anything for the teachers that are? So we do provide teacher assistance. That's part of the personnel cost that's included in the overall cost for implementation. Thank you. Rosemary. So three schools can't be implemented next year. It's so only six of the nine that don't have it. How much will it cost for the six schools? So uh, what I think the number we shared with the board that we would not spend out of the $4.85 million request next year was in the range of $600,000 for the three schools that we would not be able to implement. So I guess if 4.2 total. Four, so $4.3 million roughly would be what we would end up spending um, next year and then 600000 the following year to finish the job. And it's the three schools that we're talking about, just to be clear, since we're on, on camera, are the three schools that were mentioned in the CIP as being under construction. So essentially, it's John B. Dye and Thoroughgood, but because uh, Hermitage Elementary School is housing Thoroughgood Elementary right now on its back property, we wouldn't have the space available to do kindergarten implementation yet at Hermitage either. So why, I mean, so there's nine schools and you could implement two-thirds of it. Why is there, it take most of that money except for 600000 I'm not sure I understand the question, Councilwoman. I'm sorry. Well, you said out of the 4.85, mm -hmm. it was going to take for all nine schools. 
and but we can only do six schools and you said it would cost and, all and just to be clear it's actually 16 schools because we if we got that in advance we'd be we would be tackling all the title one schools at the same time um, so it would be all but three of the 16 schools that need full day kindergarten funded locally and through local and state dollars so we would use all of the money that would be allotted to full day kindergarten with the exception of those three schools those three schools we would wait until the fall of 2021 and uh, we would get them rolling in that in that year and my other question is all right fall of 2020 thank you <laughs> the um where we got behind with the state in 2009 mm -hmm. i think it was like 60 or 80 million dollars how far are we behind now so on a per pupil funding basis at the state level, we're re currently receiving uh, for the for the coming school year, uh, for the first time we're getting up close to the per pupil funding from 2008. We think we're still about $30 behind per pupil funding. Um, one of the big things that happened um, during the state budget cuts as a result of the recession was that they, they imposed what's called a support, uh, support position cap. Uh, so it's just a little bit complicated in the school funding world, but here's what happened. In prior to 2008, support positions, which include things like counselors and psychologists and nurses and social workers, um, were funded on what's called the prevailing method of funding, which was on average across the state, how many counselors were employed in, in, in schools, as an example. And so they would look at that on average, how many, how many counselors were in every elementary school, and they would fund schools on that prevailing methodology. So if every elementary school had two, then they'd fund every elementary school with two, essentially. I mean, they'd put it on a per pupil basis. Um, they imposed an arbitrary cap. There was really no reason for it other than to get to a, a funding cut number uh, on support positions. And they said at that time, we'll eliminate that over time. And what the state has not done is eliminate that cap. So that cap remains in place today. Uh, to give you a sense of how far we are behind as a result of that, if that cap were to be removed today and we were to return to prevailing funding methodology, that would be about an additional $25 million in state funding coming to Virginia Beach. So we're still short the $25 million. From that, from, from the support from cap money. funding right. scenario, well, from on a per pupil basis, we're just about back to where we were in 2008, but obviously that's a decade um, with stagnant per pupil funding, and so that's problematic in and of itself, yeah. given that we're trying to give our employees uh, pay increases, we're dealing with rising health care costs. Nothing, nothing has stayed the same in the past decade relative to cost for schools. Thank you. Senior John. I have a question. In last year's budget that ended, you under-executed civilian payroll by $16 million. I think it was a, little, a couple hundred thousand for benefits. Based on your current execution, how much are you under-executing and where are you estimating to be on 30, on 30 June relative to budgeted appropriated payroll relative to actual expended? So I'll let, I'll let Farrell try to tackle the actual expenditure number today. Uh, <clears throat> we're um, uh, doing analysis every week now. We, we've been doing that for the last three months, projecting what we think our year in expenditures will be and what our year in balances will be. Um, I don't have the detail of, of the salary separated from the benefits, separated from non-personnel, but it's around in the neighborhood of around 17 to 19 million dollars, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. We're protecting 5.8 million dollars of that because that's part of our budget balancing for next year that's in our budget resolution that we submitted to you in March. The reason why I'm asking, because in the last year it was 16 million dollars under execution on the labor side, and the itemization was only a couple hundred thousand on the benefit side, which would suggest, since most people take benefits, being health insurance, that you probably had the majority of your positions filled, since most of them are instructional personnel are in a classroom, which would tend to lead, mean to believe that when you're budgeting for your labor cost, your actual execution average, you're over budgeting for what the average payroll is, because if you have a high fill rate, which I think what your report did show, few vacancies, that would mean that your labor cost curve versus your reality is is over budgeted. It, and so that means you have a recurring it, excess. 
It, I, I would like to see the numbers that that, that, that differs. Could. That differs every year. It's not. It's not predictable from one year to the I, next. I we do with that. budget. Come back to my we do budget could, for attrition, which is what question, you're getting please. at. Can I come back to my question, please? Yes, sir. What I'd like to know is going back 10 years, since you'd have historical data for payroll, because I think I've done this on the city side, and there is a trend line that while you can't get the itemization, it's within a band of normalcy which showed over execution. I'd like to see what your versus budgeted FTE, which is what you do, versus what you executed on average, versus, and I think you'll see a trend line that there is a consistent, when you look at the data, you'll see that there is a consistent. I would suspect that as you've had retirements because of the older workforce retiring, that your actual labor cost curve has shifted to the left, but you're still budgeting as if it's to the right. And that's the data I would like to see. If you're suggesting that we spend the budget down to zero, that's not going to happen. I'm We're not, not going to do that. I'm not suggesting. That's I not physically uh, I prudent. think you're missing my point. There is a point at which if your actual labor costs have shifted because your, your personnel are younger because you've changed the demographic profile and your labor cost curve shifts to the left, that isn't spending to zero. That's not budgeting for money that you don't need to execute your new, your new labor curve. I'm trying to understand the labor curve based on the demographics that changes as you have retirements, which we are having in large numbers, changes that cost curve. That's true in any company. It's yeah, true anywhere. I'm trying to understand why out of that change we aren't funding the incremental $4.3 million, whatever, for full-day kindergarten versus raising taxes on people when you have the resources and the means to fund that if you properly budget and don't end up with $17 million at the end of the year, of which some of that is over-budgeted to start with. That's a commentary. I understand we might have different positions, but the data will tell the story. We can do that analysis. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Anybody else at this point? Okay, thank you all very much. Most appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, mo moving on, Mr. Manager. Yes, yes. Uh, first, Aaron, Tony, thanks a lot. Appreciate thanks, you coming in. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, Mayor, members of council, we, uh, we're going to circle back uh, with our first city briefing to our uh, director of emergency management. Aaron Sutton's going to come through the door as soon as we... Tony, see ya. Um, and uh, she was out of town last year, last week when we did all the public safety. So quick catch up, and Ms. Sutton is on deck. All righty. Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon. Um, I'll be uh, quick and to the point with emergency management. Uh, just a reminder of what our structure is for emergency management. Um, I uh, got an administrative assistant in the last budget period, which I thoroughly appreciate. Um, and then I have Kim and Danielle and Brad and Cookie that are working for my office. It has been a huge, huge help as we uh, continue to expand our roles in the city. So our budget is pretty straightforward. We are mostly salary um, in, in supporting our office. Um, we have a, our uh, operating and internal cost budget um, staying ab about the same, a little bit of, a, of an increase there. Um, just to remind you all, the, the revenue that I receive from the federal government passed through to the state government is the Emergency Management Performance Grant. It is a federal program that provides funding to emergency management agencies across the country, um, and that provides $102,914 to emergency management to help uh, support, and it provides uh, a great deal of support across the country, uh, so it's a program that we continue to, to work with FEMA to, to get support for. So there's no major changes to our budget for uh, 2020. Um, last year, you all uh, graciously awarded us an exercise funding budget, and just to let you know what we're doing with it this year, we are providing a three-day intensive disaster cost recovery program. Um, which is bringing in an, a nationwide expert to help. That's always the biggest challenge in any event or uh, disaster that we deal with is documenting our recovery costs and then actually acquiring those funds back. Our recovery workshop, which we'll be holding at the end of um, May to go through our, recover, our draft recovery plan, 
And then, um, as many of you are aware, we had an active shooter exercise on May 30th, um, and that, uh, that funding was um, able to support those operations. Um, and as our emergency operation uh, center continues to um, be used more and more often, um, obviously continuing to uh, lobby for the support of uh, the updates for uh, the joint information center and the planning cell. Um, most of you have seen this before. I won't go line for line, but I, I did want to let you know where we are with accomplishments in emergency management. Um, as you've seen in the last couple weeks, we entered into a, an agreement with Waze, which is going to greatly help us through the Something in the Water event. Uh, that was a long time coming, um, and that community partnership is, uh, is uh, allowing us to bring in data and, and work with our traffic engineering, um, but also it's going to allow us to edit and support not only for Something in the Water, but also for those flooding events that, we're, that, that we have. Um, working with GIS, um, we are definitely improving our situational awareness um, and, and building various dashboards to help provide information. Uh, just a review of the activations we've had. Um, we are still working on the Flood Mitigation Assistance Grant Program. Uh, we went back to the drawing board on that and asked FEMA to help us change how we were doing that. It has been extremely successful in taking us out of the uh, equation and allowing the homeowners to directly contract with the um, construction firms to help elevate their houses. And we have elevated uh, four to date, and we have six in the queue right now that are getting their estimates. Uh, so hopefully we will move through. We have 22 houses with funding uh, that we're hoping to move through in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, CERT continues to be extremely active um, in, in holding uh, upwards of four or five classes a year. Uh, so they have been um, very active in our special events as well and providing support to uh, the, the police department for their exercises and just recently helped down in creeds as they were practicing for something in the water. We continue to update our plans and reach out to the community. And as you all are well aware, uh, we have a very active training and exercise program. Um, and some of the things coming down the bend, the Oceana pre-exercise air show that we did this past year and we do every year um, before they before the big air show comes in September. We did our medically friendly shelter exercise um, and uh, continue to present our best practices across the country. I've been invited to multiple conferences to talk about our active shooter program, uh, how we weathered the storm with Matthew, and, and continue to talk about our, our initiatives. So um, a lot of them you've seen uh, similar. We're working through the recovery framework, um, getting back on track with our continuity of operations plan, um, and ongoing EOC training. Um, you can see um, what we're looking at down the road. We uh, started a 4th of July exercise series, and we're hoping in the next uh, six to eight months to um, pick back up and uh, continue that. Um, our commodities distribution, um, looking at our points of distribution. So if we had a disaster and had to give out water, food, or tarps, um, we have a great plan for that that we worked on with public utilities years ago. Um, if you've remembered in the past, we've given out cases of water, or if it was the health department, we've given out M&Ms um, to practice our distribution. Um, it's been a while, so we're going to hopefully come back uh, in the next 12 months and, and exercise those as well. And as always, we continue to seek uh, our grant opportunities, a lot of our funding for things like the medically friendly shelter supplies, um, for funding exercises and other things. Um, we continue to seek out grants for those. So uh, in closing, I'm really looking for the summary, uh, our summary of priorities. I really need to finish doing the EOC. I've gotten the main floor uh, with the video wall and upgrades done on that side. We have our joint information center and planning cell on the other side that we would like to get connected. Um, and uh, Public Works has that in their CIP, um, but also um, to support the funding for the ArcGIS enterprise licensing. I've talked to you about that several times um, regarding how we can improve our common operational picture and allow folks to see um, the situation that's going on. Um, we're working on several of these dashboards with something in the water, so they will be in the EOC uh, for this event. Um, but continuing to look at that enterprise license, it will open up uh, a great deal of other um, applications that, that you get with enterprise licensing. So um, that's all I have, just to kind of an update of where we are, and, uh, and I appreciate your time. Any questions? Any questions? John. 
I know the Navy has an annual HURAC, so what we call a hurricane exercise. Yes. So that we do obviously lots of parts of that we would, as a city, wouldn't be involved in. But the scenarios that, that we use, do we participate with the regional commanders relative to the scenarios that they use relative to wind, water, that kind of thing? Yes. And and we, do we participate in that simulation? So last year when we had the national level exercise, we lined up much better. We typically exercise the hurricane, the state hurricane exercises in May. The military tends to be at the beginning of April. So we've kind of been out of, out of sync. And so last year we synced up and actually worked through kind of their benchmarks, our benchmarks, and kind of brought some of those together. The last two weeks they've been going through their HURX and I participate, my office participates. We try and attend or listen in on their conference calls and answer questions on again it becomes those benchmarks when are shelters open, opening we talk through some evacuation challenges things like that so we do participate uh, with them and do you maintain a, a book somewhere or is it on online of, of the different exercises you do of the lessons learned and and and, and maybe not here but later I'd like to understand what we've learned mm -hmm. from the different exercises we've done and what we have we actually have we acted on and improved as a consequence so we do action. after action reports for every exercise and every event so from winter storm Grayson to Hurricane Florence we have after action reports and I can certainly make those available and other aspects of that that we that that we learn as we try to do things that, that would be beneficial, and maybe we already do, that we sh share at for residents as they approach the plan for season. Excellent on your part. Yep. My yep. last question, we see a lot of presentations here that talk about GIS software and licenses, and this is this has got to at least be the fourth one, I think, that we... I'd like to know how many GIS licenses that we have. And that's so, like the license per... For so right now we have how many versions her. of GIS vendors do we use? So we're an Esri shop. So Esri is the, the baseline GIS system we have. And right now we have a per seat license. So we have to pay. If I want the planning. Right. Look, it's all the same. Look, that flooding model imports to that? Yep. Okay. That. So the enterprise would get rid of all of the per seat and we would be under one umbrella instead of the per seat piece. So just to help out here, um, in about 2007, we engaged in an EGIS citywide endeavor to consolidate all our GIS effort. And we had a city manager's working group that I chaired as the deputy city manager. And so we, we consolidated those efforts. Our layer, our, our GIS center is all, you know, it's the center of gravity for all GIS. It feeds everybody who uses GIS from public utilities to Aaron's EOC shop. And so what we're talking about is renegotiating and trying to get. We're all asking for the same thing. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but they've got a, they got a pretty good gig because they have, they control the licensing and we're compliant on all aspects. So we're trying to work out because we've become such an ArcGIS-related um, institution, we, we're looking for a better deal. Gotcha. That makes sense. Now, in your EOC center, are you going to have a uh, – I know you talked about the, the screens, but you know they have the table screens that allows you to see the layers of your GIS system. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Probably it's not too rich for this budget cycle. It is. It is. I don't understand it, but that is something we should be having on our eye because that really gives you a – especially when you're looking at flood mitigation and other kind of things, because I've talked about this visualization mm -hmm. tool. Yep. When you see those table mount things with those looks, it's a whole different perspective than a normal two-dimensional look when you're thinking about the issues that you have. So that's probably something to add to your Christmas list for next year. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Thank you, and thank you for what you do. Very important. <laughs> Appreciate it. Aaron. All right, um, next we'll uh, have uh, Director of Libraries, Eva Poole. And there she is, right Hello. on cue, yes. with team. Yes. Shelby, how you been? Great. Okay. You can do the introduction. All right. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, I am pleased to present for your collective consideration 
the proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget for the Department of Public Libraries. With me today is my senior management team, Rachel Kopchick, Public Services Administrator, Clara Hudson, Support Services Administrator, Shelby Goldsmith, Administrative Services Manager, and Vicki Smith, Finance Administrative Analyst. Our total department full-time equivalent count is 253, which equates to approximately 201 full-time and 104 part-time educated, trained, and experienced staff who deliver quality library services. A community anchor for more than 50 years, Virginia Beach Public Library includes a central library, a joint use library in partnership with Tidewater Community College, seven area libraries located across the city, a public law library, a library administration and records management offices at Municipal Center, support services, adult services, and youth and family services uh, located in our central library. Libraries also has a 24-7 digital presence through our online library services, which provides residents with a vast collection of resources. Although our department collects some revenues from fines, fees, and state aid, most of our funding is provided by general city support. In addition to funding provided by the city and the state, the Friends of the Virginia Beach Public Library provide additional supplemental funding through book sales at the bookshop at our central library and proceeds of our branch book uh, nooks. The Wayhab Public Li Law Library is under the governance of the Virginia Beach Public Library. However, all operational funding, including that for personnel, is derived from a $4 fee on civil cases filed in the Virginia Beach uh, courts. Combined, the Department of Libraries proposed fiscal year 20 operating budget is $18,519,617. Seventy-eight percent of libraries' budget goes to personnel cost. Nearly 11 percent of libraries' budget is for books and materials, including the digital collections, instructional services, and programming. And I'd like to note the library's budget is 0.9 percent, less than 1 percent of the city's overall budget. Like all departments, we continually work to identify efficiencies and ensure we are maximizing our resources while also providing the best possible services for our community. I will now address the changes in our fiscal year 19 amended budget to our fiscal year 20 proposed budget. The central library budget and FTEs were reduced to create the adult services division. The adult services division is not a new unit for the library system as it was previously funded as part of the central library budget. However, adult services has grown exponentially over the last past five years and uh, this successful growth is directly tied to the programs and services established through additional funding from the Friends of the Virginia Beach Public Library. Since the division is now a system-wide program, we've created a separate budget unit to support it. The joint use library budget was reduced through a realignment of staff to meet library needs, which included hiring new staff at lower salaries than the previous incumbents. The seven area libraries budget was reduced by two FTEs, one at Oceanfront and one at Kempsville. And these positions were moved to service level two to meet the reduction in revenue forecast. And then our support services budget was moved to service level two in order to meet the 1% reduction requested of all city departments. As you may know, our department is renovating spaces in eight of our 10 library locations with a $5.8 million capital improvement project funding. The first four renovations include Princess Anne and Kemsville, which are closed to the public and will reopen in June. Bayside Area and Special Services Library, shown here in the picture, and our Central Library. We expect renovations for the next four libraries, Great Neck, Windsor Woods, Oceanfront, and Pungle Blackwater to begin later this year. In addition to uh, enclosing our children's areas, we're adding smaller service desks to be more accessible to our customers, and we're providing more shared public spaces where community members may gather to interact, share ideas, and work collaboratively. 
Keeping up with changes in technology is an ongoing initiative in libraries. In the last year, we have implemented technology upgrades in order to provide more customer services and conveniences, as well as increase access to technologies that residents might not otherwise have the chance to use. New self-check machines, pictured here, were added in November 2018. They allow customers to review their accounts, renew their items, and select from 20 languages to read on screen. As of April 1st, customers can also pay their fines and their fees at the terminals rather than wait for staff assistance or if they prefer, uh, prefer privacy when paying. In November, we also launched wireless printing as a convenience for our customers who bring their own devices to our libraries to ac access the free library Wi-Fi and still need to use our printers. Last summer, we expanded our 3D printing services from two libraries to four. We started with Central Library and then the Joint Use Library, and we've expanded to add them at Bayside and Great Neck Libraries. 3D printing service is in high demand, and customers use them for everything from printing figurines to product prototypes to missing game pieces. Another upgrade in the works is an online library card registration, which will allow us to provide library accounts and access to our digital collections without uh, the need for residents to actually come into our library buildings. It's a convenience that customers, especially our digital natives, expect today. As part of our efforts to provide free and equitable access to technologies, we offer a collection of technology devices that customers may check out. These items include Wi-Fi hotspots uh, for those who may not have internet access at home or may need it while they're on the go. We also lend programmable robots that help teens and tweens learn the basics of computer coding. And thanks to a generous donation from the Back Bay Amateur Astronomers, we also lend uh, telescopes for families to check out and view the night sky together from home. The skills needed to succeed in the 21st century are changing dramatically. Existing and emerging jobs are increasingly requiring both technology skills and soft skills, including creative, uh, creativity, problem solving, and perseverance. Having confidence in one's ability to learn new skills and to use new technologies are also critical for success. Libraries is therefore using age-appropriate educational coding toys in programming to introduce basic coding concepts to children as they have fun solving puzzles and playing games. We also provide library programs in order to teach science, technology, engineering, art, and math, which are STEAM concepts, to help residents of all ages build the skills they need to survive and thrive in a 21st century world. We teach coding to children and teens in our buildings using robots, and we take some robots on the road to Virginia Beach and Bayside Middle Schools to bring the opportunity to teens after school. You may have seen the recent article in the Beacon and the Pilot online that talked about our wooden robots used to teach basic coding skills to young children without the need for screen time on a computer or other device. And we also found out that our early elementary coding programs featuring these wooden robots, Kibo and Cubeto, have been named Outstanding Children's Program by the Virginia Public Library Directors Association. Libraries provide resources to support the needs of students in grades K through 12. On May 1st, in partnership with the schools, we will launch student public library accounts for all 67,000 public school students who will have automatic access to our digital collection using their current school ID numbers. This will be especially helpful for children who might have transportation or other challenges that prevent them from coming into a branch to obtain a library card. The student accounts will provide students with instant access to ebooks, research tools to help them with their homework, online Microsoft Office courses through lynda.com, and our language learning uh, platform to name a few resources. No library card will be needed and no fines or fees apply. Parents may opt out of the program if they choose. 
Schools and libraries have long partnered to provide Virginia Beach children with the best possible resources and opportunities, and we're committed to working together in support of improved educational outcomes for all students in our community. As our library plays a critical role in school readiness, our paradigm has shifted to outreach services because we know that people's life changes are profoundly impacted by the age at which they are exposed to books and storytelling. And because children in low-income families are less likely to get sufficient exposure to pre and early literacy activities at home, our library plays a key role in providing this public good. The city recently replaced our 2001 Windstar uh, with a new Ford Transit Connect shown here on the left. This is a supplementary early literacy outreach vehicle, which our staff takes to area preschools to provide story times, book deposits, STEAM outreach, and teacher trainings. And with support from the Virginia Beach Foundation, we are purchasing two vehicles to sustain and grow our outreach capacity and meet the needs of our community members where they are. The cargo van shown on the right was uh, funded with a $66,000 grant from the Virginia Beach Library Foundation, and we are pursuing a fully customized 2019 Ford Transit van to more efficiently provide early literacy outreach. And this vehicle will help us serve residents of all ages out in the community and bring technology and programming directly to them. Our goal is to have a mobile laptop lab on the van and other tech-specific services that we can load um, onto the van and take out into the community. This early literacy classroom on wheels is our book, new bookmobile. In our buildings, we provide early literacy story time classes for children six months to five years old, and we take these classes on the road with our bookmobile, visiting 108 preschools in Virginia Beach. We provide teacher trainings and curriculum-based story time classes to help children build skills needed for kindergarten success. The current bookmobile we have has served our community well, but it is aging. It's a large size comparable to a city bus, and it prevents us from reaching children in buildings with smaller footprints. The Virginia Beach Library Foundation received a $60,000 grant from the Hampton Roads Community Foundation toward the purchase of a new, more versatile bookmobile to sustain and increase the library's reach in Virginia Beach. So combined with this grant and others that we've received, we've helped secure half of the $210,000 cost, and we continue to raise funds in partnership with the city. It's a busy and exciting time in libraries. Our staff are preparing for our annual summer reading challenge, which reaches more than 13,600 children and teens with the goal of helping them maintain their reading skills during the, pat, uh, during the break from class. In partnership with the Virginia Beach City Schools, we um, visit 10 Title I schools once weekly to provide story times, enrollment in the summer reading challenge, and free books for the children to keep. The effectiveness of this partnership is evident in the results. Once again, 71% of the Title I students who participated in the Virginia Beach Public Library's Summer Reading Challenge either maintained or increased their de developmental reading assessment score. These results match those of last year and are consistent with the results achieved year after year. As we celebrate our 60th anniversary this year, as a municipal library, I want to take, thank the members of City Council, our City Manager Dave Hansen, Deputy City Manager Ken Chandler, as well as the members of the Management Library uh, Leadership Team for recognizing that our library system is a critical entity in our community that has continually adapted to provide our residents with the services and resources they need and expect. And on behalf of our library staff, we thank you in advance for full funding in fiscal year 20. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might thank have. Thank you. Any questions? John. You said 100 preschools on I'm assuming that includes private sector and church preschools? I believe it's just... It's the, um, public system. 
public. So it's 108 classrooms, right? Or you go to 108 schools. I don't know the. It should be 108 sites. <coughs> okay, 108 sites. Sites, right. Is there a reason why we don't look at the churches that serve in low income areas, the churches that serve those people for preschool, do those services? Because those also are people in need. Is there a reason why our scope is limited to public schools? Um, so that is something that um, we're happy to take a look at and provide further information. Just kind of, because it's, it's a client, it's another group, and it's sure. in the mission. And the other question I had was, what support, if any, do we, do we outreach for people who homeschool children? I know you have stuff for that. Mm -hmm. You could just comment on that just briefly. That people that From what that. I understand, our homeschoolers come into the library to use our services, most of them, because we are their library it's instead of the school library. So I assume they are mostly getting their services from coming into our branches. Will they be able to register for the same type of service that the public school kids do on that new access program you talked about because they don't have student account numbers? Right. Will they be able to, to get those same type of accounts? There are other options for other schools, like the homeschoolers. They could come in and get a youth services card for full access. The school system is just for um, are electronic resources. Okay. So homeschoolers, private schools could come inside the library and get a full service card. It's amazing how many homeschool children there are in Virginia Beach. It's a phenomenal number. Thank you very much. That was an sure. excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Anybody else? Anyone? Yeah, Jess. Yes, a comment. You all do such a wonderful job, and I can't wait for the Kempsville Library to get open again. That June <laughs> is coming. My son me every Sunday. So, <laughs> so why are we going to the library? It's not open yet. <laughs> Thanks. Tell him June. I should I should just go to another one, but <laughs> so close. But thank you. Okay. You all are just, I'm always impressed, and I appreciate you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, ladies. Thank, thank you. you very much. So, Mayor, members of council, next we're going to have interim director uh, for economic development, Taylor Adams, and Mr. David Couch. Taylor, thanks for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor and Council. Good afternoon, Mr. Hanson. Um, it's be a quick overview of, of our budget, just a reminder of our organization. Uh, currently 21 FTEs, um, proposed one new ad, uh, uh, funded through a reduction in our temporary staffing, so are bringing a bill payer for that. Uh, three divisions within uh, economic development, the director's office, strategic initiatives, which has been added for this year, and then Grow Smart, total budget of um, just less than $5.7 million. Um, here's a breakdown of the pie, and again, a little more on strategic initiatives here in just a moment. Uh, you'll see uh, the director's office traditionally carries everything that is in the strategic initiatives line. Uh, why, why are we breaking this out? This is just to give better visibility and clarity into what's going on within within uh, within the department as it relates to staff function. This is this is so that it's easier for me to to basically track staff activities and provide better reporting. Um, Grow smart. Not a big change in funding there. You'll see uh, we are bringing our budget in at just less or um, just less than two hundred and sixty thousand sixty two thousand dollars less than last year. That is primarily attributable to reduction in staffing expense. Within the strategic initiatives budget unit, bio, uh, this, this again, you all will, uh, will remember that we've just launched 19 new uh, startups within bio. We're moving into an acceleration phase there. Uh, it's important that we, that we add some focus to the way that we are reporting and monitoring what's, go what's going on within bio. Same with cyber. Cyber continues to be a, uh, cybersecurity in particular, continues to be a hot sector for us. We want to know what's going on there and make sure that, that we, we understand everything, uh, every, all of our successes within that space. And then also advanced manufacturing, logistics, and retail. Logistics in particular is something that I would mention is just sort of an other thing that we really want to track right now as we're, as we're seeing some activity in that space. We, uh, you have heard us say, and we are continuing to focus on enhancing what is the small business ecosystem within our community and create, creating a better avenue for startups and particularly our outreach to diverse populations of business owners. Also, um, uh, again, mentioned the addition of the FTE. And then this is just going back to a little, a little more detail on the $262,000 reduction. Uh, we, uh, we have seen significant turnover through retirement and uh, 
and attrition in the office to the point that we have uh, six vacancies that we are currently working our way through right now, and that's given us an opportunity to reorganize the office to be um, uh, what we would say a little more current with what's happening in the field of economic development. Um, GrowSmart uh, is working through the final pieces of receiving a Bloomberg What's Work, What Works Cities grant. This is an exciting announcement for us. Um, we, uh, we are reserving uh, just less than $51,000 um, as the match for the first year of what is a three-year grant from, from Bloomberg, but we want to firm that up and come back to you with more information in the future. Um, I'm not going to read all this to you. This is just a quick, uh, a, a quick reminder of the many uh, initiatives and, uh, um, and other activities that we have underway at present. Most important thing here to mention again for um, Virginia Beach Bio, uh, the enhanced small business activity. And then I'll add one more to this, which is sort of eating up a lot of my time right now, and I think more. And it's, and it's, uh, it's our site readiness and, uh, and the development of, uh, of shovel-ready commercial and industrial sites here, here in the city. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Right. Oh. Yes, sir. I, I'd like to jump in. I, I've got to engage you. We, we, we've got to have this conversation. Or you want to lead out with a question or you no, want no. me to run it? No, no, I just said that was on my list that that had not been resolved from the retreat. Correct. Um, so um, I uh, have been sharing with you uh, my conversation at the regional level, uh, there is a master agreement to uh, remain engaged with the region as a member of Hereda. Uh, you saw my, uh, I gave you copies of my markup. Uh, my markup was the result of Taylor's work with Ron uh, sitting together and trying to evaluate what uh, the city's participation in Hereda had been. Uh, what the feel of the region was about our city. Uh, also to gauge the conversation, the rather um, um, engaged uh, conversation you all had at your retreat about Hereda and uh, the concerns that you had with regards to cost uh, and return on investment, uh, if I had to classify the conversation. Uh, my meetings with uh, the uh, large city managers, that uh, special committee that was formed to have a discussion with the Hereda leadership, uh, were, in my opinion, proved uh, fruitful. And I responded uh, with a letter to you all showing you the markup of the changes uh, that they are uh, committed to making to accommodate uh, Virginia Beach's con continued one more year in uh, Hereda. Hereda three, I call it, because as you know, their executive director has moved on and <clears throat> the, uh, the business leadership uh, members have decided to take on a fundraising initiative whereby the private sector will match the government sector uh, dollar for dollar, which has never happened. It's been Pretty much 80-20 uh, uh, would be the best I think I've ever seen numbers-wise. Um, and uh, so the master agreement, if you read carefully, it shows that we'll make installments uh, related to uh, matching. Uh, they are uh, the leadership of private, uh, the privates are out there um, engaging in all the jurisdictions that are participating in Hereda. To, to raise those funds. They have, uh, the latest report I had last week was they are doing very well at matching. Some of you have had some meetings uh, regarding that and hopefully you're hearing the same thing that they're coming through with the uh, business uh, commitments. Uh, commitments are not the same as cash uh, delivery of a check. Uh, so um, you saw in my uh, markup of the master agreement a request for uh, quartering or, or semi-annually making our payments and that they are giving reports back to have those dollar-for-dollar dollar matches <laughs> associated with that. I also heard from you uh, a concern about um, weighted voting or the lack thereof uh, in regards to our uh, significant dollar um, contribution. Uh, there was um, a very uh, 
engaged discussion with fellow city managers with regards to that. <coughs> there is a concern uh, by some cities that if uh, Chesapeake and Norfolk and Virginia Beach uh, form an alliance on an issue, we would have the votes in weighted scenario to overrule everybody else in the in the in the group, and that's that's true. Uh, there are if. Chesapeake continues to grow. There's actually a math formula that would say that all, only Chesapeake and Virginia Beach could bond and over, over, overdo the other members, uh, depending on their growth rates over the period of uh, years to come. There was also a concern that if that was a scenario created, there might be reluctance on the part of the elected bodies in other jurisdictions to want. I think that's a perception of Virginia Beach that is in change. I say that because we continue to step up and participate on numerous regional initiatives. We are, we are sharing far more than we've ever shared, at least from my 14 years, my perception. And that's a conscious effort because um, when you hired me to move from the small cubicle to the larger cubicle, uh, my sensing was we may have been perceived as a bully uh, in the region. And my fellow CAOs have been very frank and forthright with me, and I don't pull my punches with them, so they've started not pulling their punches with me, and it's, it's a good relationship that we have. And so working deliberately to be a better regional player is really important for the largest jurisdiction in the region, and you know, one of the most prosperous. And so there's been a changing of their perception thanks to a couple of initiatives that you've endorsed and that you have participated in from from stormwater. And I know it's not where you want it to be, but you're you're in the trenches, Ms. Henley, and thank you very much for, because I serve on the CAO subcommittee for stormwater and I, I'm in the trenches there to, uh, to broadband. And economic development is critically important because we all know that our financial success is going to be based on our economic growth. And so um, the last item of concern that I heard from the retreat was the uh, 450 plus thousand dollars dollar per capita increase that they had put to us. And uh, I went back to them and asked for the cap to remain in place that we had established at 400,000. We're the only jurisdiction that's anywhere close to that. And so they concurred and they have kept us at that. Uh, there were uh, some other wordsmithing in there about metrics and uh, being responsive to local needs. Uh, some some uh, expansion of the uh, of the uh, clustering, uh, the areas that are emerging from when the IBM study took place. There's some more modernization taking place. Some more applicability to what our our city provides, as opposed to something like Suffolk with large land use and ready develop. I will tell you that what Taylor has learned and what Ron and I are uh, supporting and working on is we really haven't thought past uh, the corporate uh, locations, corporate park locations that we have. I think uh, the biomedical park now being called Innovation Park because we think there's other opportunities for other emergent technologies uh, to move in there and to be participative in that land development that we are going to break ground on to, to get the uh, entry road area um, there across from Winterberry, but that's a, that's a good access uh, because we've invested in our uh, Princess Anne and uh, to get the stormwater and the BMP and the utilities and the broadband all at a site-ready condition. But we also have to advance our investment in other sites that are ready to, to um, allow um, outside aid uh, organizations, private companies to look at us. Um, the leads from the state council come through the regional organization. That is the way the Commonwealth is working from their Secretary of Commerce. And, and so those leads, if they are to come, if they come through the state, uh, will funnel through Hereda. And participating and remaining a member of that organization uh, connects us to that. I can tell you that the track record of Hereda producing for the city of Virginia Beach is abysmal. Just not going to sugarcoat it because you all know we really haven't gotten much.
Um, we really haven't gotten anything, to be honest. So um, in my budget, I did uh, put $400,000. Uh, if you were to say, nope, we're not going to do that, I would ask you to allocate that money to hiring three to four more coordinators to ramp up what we're not going to be able to have if we resume our relationship with with the region which quite frankly my take of our organization my economic development department was that we were not fully engaged, nor were we as participative or collaborative or responsive as is necessary to run down leads. And I also question the, the capability of, um, of our leadership to get that done. And that translates into our ability to um, develop our personnel to do those actions. And so we are weak on that front. We've had six retirements uh, because things need to improve. And we are, we are working in the background uh, to resurrect a, a, a competency level, but uh, more importantly, the word accountability is being brought into this department. And so this is a rather elongated catch you up, uh, but there is a lot behind what I'm telling you today that's ongoing with regards to what needs to take place. We, Virginia Beach, have been a fairly successful city. Uh, we have been able to attract people because of the quality of life that you have maintained as the elected body and invested in. We've also been able to preserve that quality of life due to our delivery of quality services. And uh, I only wonder, as I sit here as your city manager, that if we were this good, could we have really been this good? And so this emerged in my speech to the Central Business District in January, the speech that I usually give, which was about really realizing the potential because I don't believe that we have realized the potential of what our economic development department can really deliver, and that's what this interim director has been challenged to do, and that deputy city manager has been full-time trying to help them all. So that's my pitch for staying in Hereda, and I'm prepared to answer any questions related to that and allow you to tackle Taylor's work Jeff. in ED. Dave and I met yesterday, and you, we talked a lot about yes, the leadership of economic development, and he mentioned that you're doing a lot as far as metrics, and I, if you could elaborate more on what the new leadership is doing so we have a better grasp of what's changed and how we're improving. Sure, and so um, would like to reserve the right to come back with something a little more polished than what you're going to hear right here, but the, uh, um, but, uh, the first thing that we realized, we needed a better understanding of what is baseline data. Uh, it, you didn't have to go far to hear a lot about um, about our in, about where we performed, not just as a city, but as, as a region, specific, specifically the MSA, compared with other MSAs. We often heard that we were falling behind. That did not align with what we were seeing on the ground in our own city, though. And so we're working. Um, we have a, I would tell, call it an emergent relationship with a with two economists working in higher ed full time. The idea being to to better understand what was our actual performance over the forecast period. Uh, we think this is a, a key contributor to, to what, what can become a true indication of a local gross domestic product. That's not something we've ever been able to show you, but it, it's a cornerstone of our business because we can make all the announcements in the world and we can give you all of the job creation and all of the economic investment numbers in the world, but if we don't understand the, uh, the, other, side of that, the other side of that equation, I, what is the exit rate from our local economy, um, and, wh and, what's, and why is that happening? We can't really give you a true factor of what growth would be. So, th so it's really within that vein that we're, that we're building this. Also, um, that would be sort of at the strategic level. At the tactical level, we're building what I would say, coming, o coming off of Mr. Hansen's words, um, term accountability. The idea is who are we seeing, why are we seeing them, what are we doing there, and what's the value to the taxpayer of Virginia Beach? Again, that is 
the, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of what we're doing is, is sort of a, a core component of doing business on behalf of the public. And, and we understand that we've got a little work to do in firming that piece up as well. Finally, I would say the third bucket would be how we're handling the investments that, that are made into local businesses here in Virginia Beach. And, and uh, uh, the program is called the Economic Development Investment Program, not Incentive Program. And so uh, a big difference for me between an incentive and an investment, an investment's expected to have a return. So I think we, we, owe, the, we owe the community a little more information on what kind of return they can expect out of the investments that we're asking the public to make in local businesses. Yeah, Jess. So um, j just to make sure I heard you right, and I, I appreciate that. I think I like the idea of moving to investment versus incentive. The As far as what we're looking at, we're looking, <coughs> I'm sure the economists you're mentioning are looking at what would have come organically or naturally to us versus what we're actually getting as a result of our work and our efforts. So, so yes, we believe that's the, the confluence of where the increased accountability and the data that they gather come together. It's idea, if they can tell us how our region would have grown organically and then we can chart performance either above or below that, then we really know what the office did. And yes. are we ana doing an analysis of what is creating the best positive environment for businesses to grow organically so we can pick up on those uh, smaller businesses that have a lot of potential that maybe, you know, it, but you, you always talk about like the Amazons right. or Starbucks, and they, they, you know, it, the truth of the matter is, is that if you make one of those companies, you're more likely to keep and retain them versus trying to bring them into the area. So, so that is, that is, so yes. Okay. Ad, admi <laughs> admittedly, that's not a, that is not a place where we have a great deal of data today. One of the things that that Ron and I talk about a lot, and that I have Dave Coucher on my staff as well, that he and Dave leads our bio initiative or has led our bio initiative. To, so he's been sort of directly involved in this small business startup space, which really has been what bio is to date. And so we understand that one of the places where we're a little behind, it's 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 in that front. If you look at if you look at some of our neighbors in the region, there's one community that has five and an out five spaces focused exclusively on small business startup and building an ecosystem. They announced another one last week. We don't we have we have seventeen oh one, I don't have anything else and, and, and our office is not traditionally engaged in that space. So so that's one where um, I would tell you we need a little more strategy before I can bring you a meaningful a meaningful metric on what success would look like, but but we understand that we've got to go there and quickly. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah John. I went back and looked at the last year's adopted operating budget. Yes on this $2.5 million, and in that year, I think it was $1.8 million was the number that's in the little side sheet on the left that talked about the explanation of last year's operating budget. There's, in this year's, there was no description in the operating budget as to what the $2.5 million was going to buy. There is a note that was supposed to be a transfer payment to the Economic Development Authority. I, I think we need to really revisit when we move money to that organization. Uh, I think we need to think about why we're setting money as aside, because I think what if the opportunity came in that was $4 million? Would we let the $2.5 million hold us back? Probably not. But if you look at the at least the public perception of the track record and the business acumen that's being demonstrated by that authority, uh, it's, it's not building, it's not a high confidence level. It might be right down there in this other group. So I think we have to rethink that relationship, I don't know what that is, but I think the past practice, and we've yet to see what comes out of some other things that are underway that might reveal more things forthcoming, uh, but we've got to rethink that relationship and when money moves and what that criteria is before we make these appropriations and transfers of funds that we show up and appropriate for your department, but in the description it says, the intention is to transfer that to the Economic Development Authority. I think that's a bad, a bad model. I think that has to be re-looked at okay. on, on how that works. That's, I think experience has dictated that more caution and more oversight is necessary than what has previously been exercised. That's just I, would, uh, I would just, uh, you, you kind of came back in on the tail end of Taylor's response to Ms. Abbott. Uh, one of our shortfalls, our shortcomings, uh, has been the incubator, uh, startup incubator, slash to accelerator, slash to where do, where do you go from waking up one day and saying, I got a really good idea and I need to create my business model 
And then once I figure out what that business model is, maybe just find a place that somebody can talk to me about that. And so uh, some of these dollars that they had me add into this budget item is to lay out where we're going to try to do. And it, it's, it's not like you can go find a shopping mall space and expect people are going to gravitate to it. There just seems to be this synergy of where you where you put that to make it work. Just creating a space, it's got to be a, the right space in the right environment for the right people to show up and want to be actively engaged in learning how to do business, how, how to open up small business or to um, accelerate their initiative. So this is some seed money that's engaged in that. It's different than what you're talking about, but we will take what you have asked for, we do have liaisons to our Economic Development Authority, two of them that are signed here, uh, and we'll engage with them uh, to to flush out a conversation about monies to the Development Authority. Well, liaisons aside, I have my own responsibility and accountability to the public, and I'm speaking for myself. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm just telling you that the current, I find the current situation unsatisfactory. Yes, I'm speaking for myself. And, and I'll exercise that. But I have, I do appreciate the candidness on all the stuff I did read through all the stuff you provided. I thought, Thank you. Uh, I thought the, the changes are good. But the words don't change culture. I, in my alternative budget, I haven't marked that. Thinking it needs some chance to see, you know, three strikes and you're out. But I, but I do think that the words themselves are meaningful and are substantive changes for accountability. But I think it remains to be seen whether or not the underlying culture that that organization has, and every organization has one, can really make the bearing change. And, and we'll see. But I, I do agree that they deserve the opportunity to try that. But if that can't change and come around here the next year, I wouldn't be as receptive to, to funding that because I think they have to demonstrate that they're not just words but there's substantive material change in how they operate. And so they shouldn't, that, and I just don't want that. I'm sure that message has been conveyed. I'm pretty certain it has been, but I'm just wanting to sure that, that that's where I'm at. But I, but I think that you've done a great job of changing the words and the parameters that they should be operating under. The key is, can they make the organizational turn and perform? And, yeah, and thank you. Thank you, John. Lois. I got to agree a lot with what John just said. Every year we go through this process, and every year we have this discussion about Heretta. Every year we're asked to go one more year and fund them and give them another chance to make a go of it. And every year it fails. And I just want to know what it is that's going to be so different this year because the players are all the same. There's really no difference in the players that are involved in this. And the result is always the same. And that is, we get nothing out of it. And I... Okay. Know, In I, response. I am very, very concerned that we're just throwing money down the drain again. Can, can we respond? Can I build on Lewis's remarks? I think what would be very helpful, competition always sometimes help people, that we should be built, since we don't have an organic capability today, while we are giving them this maybe third strike and you're out chance, we should be having the plan so that we can transition and we know what it would take for us to organically execute and move out so when the event that they don't perform, we aren't sitting here waiting. Mm -hmm. we don't, we're, we're already at the gate. And we're ready to kick out of the blocks and run and move on our own. And when people kind of see that you are, you are ready to move out and you're building the capacity and you have a plan to do it, and then when they don't, it's over, we're on our own, and off we go. I, and I could, but you have to be prepared to do that, so it takes time to plan. So, can, yes, sir. Good planning is good strategy. Okay, Rosemary, then Sabrina. Probably been a lot more than three strikes, you're out. I've been generous. <laughs> because 
we had these discussions before you were elected, Bobby. We talked about it 2001, I believe. And every year, it's the same thing. Do we stay in? Do we not? And, you know, we, we, want, we want to be good neighbors. You know, we, we, we want, we know regionalism is important. We need to be working with our, our sister cities in the region. I'm not talking about sister cities in the Philippines or, but I mean, we, we know that and we've been trying to do that. And I think I said at the, at the retreat, it's like, we keep getting dressed up for the date and he doesn't show up. You know, you know we, we think we get, we get all dressed up and we're waiting for the date to show up and he doesn't come. She doesn't come. So I don't always agree with John, but um, I think I, I would probably give it just because, Dave, I respect the changes that you have implemented. Because you, you listened to us and you, you heard it and you and you've tried really, really hard. But I agree that you, you have to have a plan B. I do, and a C. So and we're you know. probably the bullpen's got a D. Yeah. And so maybe when we say this one more time, we really mean it one more time. Ma'am. Sabrina. I've had a chance. I remember having this discussion about Heretta during the staff retreat, and I have to say, I, I listened to the responses and um, had a chance to get sit down, ask questions, kind of see how things were being changed and structured. And a lot of the concerns we had, Dave was able to sit down and work with them, and were able to address all of those concerns. And you know, I had a chance to sit down and talk with them and. They told me about how they redeveloped their structure, you know, and how they really believe this time with the new structure they have with partnering, which one of the uh, concerns was, I remember, was really tapping into the, um, you know, the corporations and the businesses to get, you know, their buy-in and get their input. And I think that's something that is purposely and intentionally being done this time. Um, and so I, I see... Um, I guess I would say um, hope, you know, in Hereda with those changes, with that structure. The other part is I would say we do need to be really concerned about how, you know, if we don't continue the relationship, the implications and the impact to the region, because there will be an impact to the region. There will be an impact to the other surrounding cities, and it will be a detrimental impact and I've talked with some of the leadership in different cities, and they have expressed that. And they have expressed the need to have Virginia Beach, you know, a part of Hereda. And I listened to that. I think that's important. I think we need to consider that before, you know, we decide that we don't want to be a part of it. And I, I think that as a new person coming in, uh, I respect that commitment to change, and I would like to, you know, for us to give them an opportunity um, to do so. Uh, the other part of it is I'd just like to say uh, to you, Taylor, thank you for what you, you know, the huge undertaking that you've taken with the economic department. That's something that you have inherited and you've been working hard to turn and change things, uh, turn them around. So I, I say thank you to you and your staff for working on that because I know that it is a huge undertaking, you know, and I appreciate your efforts and all that you're doing. Okay, Jim Wood. Thanks. <clears throat> well, not, not to pile on, but I'd say for well over a decade, I've been one of the ones who said that HREDA has significant issues, and just like Rosemary and Lewis have said, every single year it's been, you know, give us one more chance. You know, that said, the, this movement with what I consider real business people who have taken it over and real, real community uh, regional leaders get, gives me hope. Um, I, I think it's worthy of, of, of perhaps a final chance here. And, and I'll be candid. I shared my my issues with them when I was with them with the mayor, and and I think they'll tell you these business leaders that that they they think that that they just have one more chance to make it right. Um, 
I like the fact that that they're going away from being heavily government subsidized to being, you know, both public and private sector subsidized. Um, there, there, there's a number of regional opportunities for for development that, that I think are certainly interesting to us. Certainly things around the ITA on the Chesapeake side of the ITA that would that would be complementary to to what we we do and some other things over there. So I, I would think that it would just make sense to have them after the budgets over and the dust is settled that we, we get them to come in and do oh, yeah. a full-blown presentation to the council to talk about it. And I think at that point is when we need to be ready to ask ask the hard questions as a group because I know they've met with, with some of us. I don't know if they've met how many people they've met with yet because they, they, they're going down a list. But I think it would be I think it would be helpful if we're all sitting here feeding off of each other, getting information and say, oh, I forgot to ask this and and to get that information, I, I think that would be extraordinarily helpful to get it in, because we really haven't had them in in, in years to 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 talk about the the performance. So, yeah, it, just like I told them, I said, you know, look, if, if they brought in, you know, pick pick some some major corporation, I you know, we'd be willing to to give them a heck of a lot more than four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year if they brought Amazon in, for example. But but that that's not the case. So it, there there is some some need to have it a little bit more performance based in my mind um, it is essentially a sales organization if you will and or that's what it's supposedly been in the past and I think that's you know if you have salesmen you, you compensate them based on the sales they make so so I, I'd like to see them come in and, and and talk about it at you know not not now we've got way too much going on sure. with the budget but I'd, I'd like to do it where we, we yes, could spend an hour or so going over it and asking questions hey anybody else um, if I could say, first of all, I'd like to thank the body for the tenor and the dialogue that we just had. I think it was very constructive, interactive, and, uh, you know, it, it really addressed, you know, some serious problems that we had to deal with. And the fact of the matter is that we, as a body, also have some significant challenges ahead of us. We have a $2 billion budget. We have a $3.7 billion obligation towards stormwater, $3 billion obligation to schools. We have to take care of salary compressions and other things in other uh, areas. We've got debt service to think about. Our obligations far exceed our income. And the only way we're going to get or circumvent this is effective economic development. We have to bring in these new businesses. We have to bring in the new revenues. And, uh, you know, the point is, though, um, it was pointed out that, you know, in the past, economic development um, has significant room for improvement and being, um, you know, gracious. And, and, you know, sometimes in the Marine Corps, we called it an attitude adjustment. And we had to retool and go about things a little bit different way. And um, a couple of years ago, our process improvement team did a study on the barriers to small business startup and expansion, and we found out that, you know, we were a major obstacle in, in that happening. But I am confident now, you know, with the new direction, with the, the new accountability that we're talking about, uh, you know, a simple thing, I was talking to Mr. Williams a couple of uh, weeks ago about the nexus of having our economic development work more with our planning department. It doesn't make sense to bring in a business and have them wait two years to get plans approved. So this way, you know, there's going to be more coordination, integration about things. Uh, discussion with uh, Taylor about having shovel-ready projects ready to go. You know, that was another area that needed to be improvement. But what I'm what I'm starting to see is a new interest in people wanting to come to Virginia Beach, a new attitude, uh, you know, the thing of a level playing field that anybody that comes to this city is going to be treated with respect and dignity and have the equal op uh, thing. Improving the processes, like we were saying, when somebody wants to open up a business here, you know, okay, what pipeline do they go into so that they're able to do this? So I think we got, you know, through adversity, find opportunity. And, you know, I can't underscore enough that going forward, that economic development and bringing in those new businesses and leveraging the broadband and the other opportunities, the innovation areas that we're having, I think we're making strides in that direction to achieve what we have to do. 
But once again, I thank you all for the conversation. I thought it was constructive. I thought it was critical. And, um, you know, great stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Thanks, Taylor. Yes, David. Next, we have David Trimmer, uh, Agriculture. And believe it or not, we're on track. Thank you, sir. Hey, David. It's good to be here. Yes, Mr. Mayor, Council. Sir, how are you today? Doing all right? Yeah, as I was introduced, I'm David Trimmer, and I'm the Agriculture Department, and I would like to get this thing started. Please. Small department, as you well know, uh, nine FTEs, eight of them shown. We have one job opening right now. We have we had a retirement, and uh, I think in 1st of April, a uh, 15-year employee retired in our uh, uh, administrative side to handle a lot of our 4-H stuff. So a very small department, $1.1 million budget. As you see, that is not what we're asking for, but you will, you will go to the next slide. There's our simple pie chart. It's basically proposed budget funding by the general funds. It's, it's 930000 as you see up there. The difference is we, we bring in 200, we're budgeting $239,256 in revenue, which comes through the farmer's market, which you're well aware of. Uh, right now, we, are, uh, we exceeded the budget last year, the fiscal year-end budget, by 11%. Uh, of for the market for last year. We're well on pace to exceed that budget again this year. We are already through March 90% of the budget. We are having another great year at the farmer's market. So I, I further believe we'll, we'll make the 239 next year. I think we'll probably finish in somewhere around that 275, 280,000 this year, and I'm expecting another great year next year. We continue to set revenue records at the market going forward. Uh, my next budget, or my next pie chart, please is the uh, basically, you know, we're pretty much made up of salaries and operating money. Uh, the, uh, the operating money down there, the 570, a lot of that is in our Virginia Cooperative Extension Agreement. We have, uh, we support four agents through an MOU with Virginia Tech. Uh, they provide outstanding service to our uh, southern agriculture community, horticulture side, the ag side, the, uh, uh, the, the horticulture side, the master gardener side, the 4-H, and our uh, uh, what I used to call the home ec side. It's the uh, money and nutrition side. Basically, you see uh, director's office is break even or basically a little bit 2% under uh, where we're requesting. We're requesting a 1% increase on the extension side. 16% on the uh, farmer's market side is because last year we converted a two part two part times to a part time. Uh, that's what got us the, the increase in FTEs. And as you can see, Overall, we're looking at a 4.2% increase, 930000 which, again, we are going to make up a good bit of that in our revenue through the market. The uh, next problem, our next issue is our ARP program, 85,900 uh, 85, in uh, salaries, 134. This is just our operating money, what it takes us to run that area. Uh, it does not include our debt service, and we'll, we can go to the next chart, and you will see what that is made of. Basically, we're looking at a 1% increase on that side for, rev, uh, for expenses. The debt service is down uh, 8%. That's, that's basically budgeting less on the uh, closings for uh, land. It was budgeted the previous year at 400 acres. This year, we're budgeting at 300 acres. It's normally always been 300 acres, uh, just as an FYI. Uh, the reserves is, uh, is a small amount of money. And the CIP transfer is the money that we, that, that we agreed upon last year to transfer funds to the southern part of the city to help out with projects like Asheville Park, all reoccurring flooding, uh, flooding projects. And uh, to date, Public Works will probably cover it, but it's gone very well in what the team has done down there to help out the southern part of the city. Uh, growth areas, uh, 136 million we've uh, it's, uh, uh, estimated as the economic impact for 2018. That's about 4.5% increase over 2017, and it is not across the board. We, uh, on the commodity side, everybody's familiar with what's going on on the trade tariffs. Uh, corn is pretty much, was down. I mean, corn was pretty much stagnant for here. Uh, our soybeans were down in, in our, our margin, and our wheat was up a little bit, but not much. Our overall acreage was down a little bit. We dropped an acreage some, uh, not, not significantly. Uh, Horse was up a little bit, not a great deal. The fruits and vegetables were, was, was where we saw a pretty significant drop last year. And a lot of that was due to weather. And uh, we did not have a great year on the weather. Obviously, our strawberry plants were planted in September. 
Uh, we are going to be harvest. We are harvesting, well, harvesting and having picked strawberries now. You can see them on the table, and we are excited. We're farmers, so we are excited every spring. So as uh, we move forward, uh, our other our other thoughts being uh, all facets of agribusiness remain strong. We, we are optimistic. We're remember we are small, medium, and large sized businesses. That's what this is. What economic development was before us. It's one of the reasons we follow economic development. We are about growth in the sustainability of agriculture, which is a, again, a small generational farming. Uh, you, you, there, you saw the article, I'm sure some of you saw the article in the Virginia Pilot recently talking about all the challenges to the average age of farmers and people wanting to get in. Small farms are increasing. Medium farms are either going to small farms or medium farms are getting eaten by Pac-Man, which are larger farms. And that is a trend throughout. But you know, you got to ask yourself, and I was, I've been a lot of time at the state the last three months, we're going to go from about 7.5 billion people to about 9.5 billion people. And a lot of that growth is going to be overseas. The U.S. growth is stagnant to increase a little bit. And our growth in the U.S. In, is basically immigration. That's where our growth is going to come. So the growth markets are, we've got to figure out our relationship with China. Once we leave China, or once we address that, we've got to go to Europe. We've got to go, especially like England and Ireland and Scotland. We do not have free trade with those countries. We've got to, we're going to have to go after Japan. And a lot of that has been addressed, as you guys all know, and a lot of you've looked at it. Uh, I can go on all day about this, but you, that's not what I'm here for. The, uh, uh, again, I've told you about the farmer's market. Again, our hoedown hoe season started this month, April 1st. We run about 30 hoedowns this year. And I can't tell you, you know, you saw the storm that came Friday. You know, the people even think we're going to cancel that, that event. You know, I called the, the market and I said, you know, we need to make the call by Tuesday at, or by Thursday at 2. I was foreclosing it, for calling it off that night. Man, the people just uprose. They said, we're coming. The band's going to play. Come on, don't, don't shut us down, Dave. So we, we, we're going to continue on. Ice skating rink was a good deal. They're coming back this year. We had 49 operating days. We had somewhere between 14 and 19 days of not great weather. What's not great weather? Less than, less than uh, 50 skaters is what I called it. Sometimes it was 25 skaters. What we saw during the Christmas holiday was that week was phenomenal numbers. And the, and the Facebook was lit up by people from out of town. The example I'll give was you had relatives from in town. They're coming down for the holiday. After a few days, you're tired of having them in the house. Where'd they go? They went to the aquarium. Where'd they go? They got to go ice skating rink. What did they do, what did they do at the ice skating rink? They wore out the perimeter of the ice skating rink because nobody knew how to skate across the middle. And uh, it actually went very well. We, if we could get Mother Nature to cooperate, we're looking forward. The ice skating rink people, national players, says we want to come back. So we're going to try it again. Next, please. Uh, uh, the ARP program, we do, get a fair, we do get a decent amount of money. Through the years, we've got 1.4 million. I think five localities throughout the state received money uh, the last couple of years. Virginia Beach is always one of them because we've got a great program. We utilize that money on, on our ARP program. We've got, we're, we're dying to be able to stand here before Mr. Dyer and the rest of you and say we're at 10,000 acres and we're knocking on the door. Uh, we closed on 151 acres so far. We've got another 113 we should close at any time. And we may use some state money for that to do that. We bought 186, 87, 867 development rights. I'm sorry, reading that backwards. Go ahead, please. How we do business, agritourism, we do farm tours, we do taste of the market tours, we collaborate with our, uh, with our convention and tourism group. There's, a, there's an event going on right now, it's called the Urban, Suburban, Urban Ag Urban. Summit at Regent. And that is where we're bringing all the, age, all the national players in, from extension around on the urban side, and they're all over at Region. I closed the meeting on Thursday, I think, at 2.30, if you want to come out and hear me. Pungo Strawberry Festival, 36th annual event, is this Memorial Day weekend. So if you want to see something pretty cool, the media day is May 8th, I think. I will send some of you the media date, because you may want to go out, go out for the media day. Uh, that's when they announced the, the, uh, the, the witch the mayor, the, uh, master, the, the parade chair for the, for the event. Uh, exposed K-5, we, we do about 3,000 kids a year at the farmer's market on our educational programs. That has really gone well. We have, uh, the last two years, we have been home to uh, uh, the National F uh, Farm Bureau where they teach the, the, the teachers about uh, ag in the classroom. 
Uh, that is in August, hottest part of the year, but we collaborate with Public Works, utilize their facility. We bring in about 70 locals teachers and we bring about 70 teachers from around the region the next day. Uh, everything is going great at the market. The gardens are in play right now. Our master gardeners do a great job. Uh, it, it, the market really looks good. Our Public Works team has done a fantastic job there. Uh, farm, farm the library program. We're doing, we're, our goal is to do four libraries. I'm working on Great Neck. No problem with Kempsville Central and Bayside. The farmers there have been doing it for years. They love it. And uh, uh, they've got a great following there. Uh, again, the hoedowns, eight major events. We continue to focus on tourism. And uh, go ahead, please. Continue to pro promote and support 4-H programs. May, Memorial Day, the week after Memorial Day weekend, I will send it to you because the mayor, you'll probably be asked to come down and, and, and talk. The, uh, we do the show and sale program where we raise about $200,000 at a live auction down in the southern part of the city that will go to scholarships, it goes to school, where we, where we participate with, with any kind of program with to put forward money, the same way the Pungo Strawberry Festival does. Uh, we continue to support local community events, and we are partners with Buy Fresh by Local, Virginia uh, Dare Soil and Water Conservation, Pungo Strawberry Festival. The Ag Banquet took place this year. The mayor was there. I really appreciate that. And uh, it was another great year. That event has been going on since 1966. In closing, in closing, I'm asking for $930,000, basically. And that's the same thing. We're not asking for any more, any less than what we've been. But I will read this little comment. Yeah, we, we, the Ag Department, in which you guys are all a part of, because you notice when you get my emails, I say the Ag Team, because that's who we are. We support the rural character of Virginia Beach. The agricultural area of the city supports farms and, fam farms and homes, families and homes, businesses, small, medium, and large, and that includes your generational farms, because they're, they're very abundant. Where our kids have gone off, well, everything we talk about in this room, they go off and go to college, and they come back, and they want to take part in the farm. Farm. The Barneses, the Henleys, the, uh, the, the Cromwells, the, the, the Horsleys, you could just name them right there. Uh, we, we, uh, we provide employment, local foods, local foods sourced here that, that goes, all our fruits and vegetables, we don't, we don't send it to Richmond, we don't send it to D.C., we don't send it to a company to ship it somewhere else, we consume it here in Virginia Beach, and you have some excellent strawberries sitting right there on the table. Uh, the southern part of the city is about recreation. It's about green space, and, and it's about, we can't forget, it's about wildlife. It's a habitat for wildlife. Uh, if you ever want to get on and play with a snake, we've got plenty of them there on a wet day. And, okay. uh, and it's about the environment, and that's what we're about. Yes. So uh, with that, I'll close, and if anybody's got any questions, I, I'm more than glad to stand up here for two hours and talk to you guys. Outstanding presentation. <laughs> any uh, questions? Thank you all, and I appreciate no, your time. Thank you all what you do. Thank you all. Thanks, David. Sir. Yeah. Bit of passion there, Jody. Yeah, take we're going to break here. right after this. Okay, uh, God, I lost track. Who's next? Uh, that would be um, Brad Van Dommel, uh, Director of Convention and Visitors Bureau, and his team. Thanks, Brad. Glad you made it today. Thank you, Mr. Hansen, and uh, Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, as you're aware, tourism is a uh, important <laughs> element of our local economy, and our most recent uh, full year. Uh, numbers demonstrated that uh, we had over 19 million visitors coming into our community, contributing over $2.45 billion in direct spending and generating over $60 million in local taxes. Uh, so I'd like to present uh, our budget that will continue to support these positive activities for Virginia Beach. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the revenues uh, by fund on the left, the left pie chart, uh, shows our revenues, shows that uh, $12.9 million, that's the blue section, uh, is from our TAP fund. And uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the TAP fund, but about 1% of the 8% hotel tax plus $1 flat tax per room night is what funds the TAP fund along with a half a percent of our 5.5% restaurant tax. Uh, the next revenue area is the TIP fund at $5.4 million, that's the green area. That again is funded to... Uh, primarily from our hotel taxes, 5% of the 8%, and a little over 1%, 1.06% of the 5.5% restaurant tax. And then in the purple area, we have our city support through the general fund at $6.3 million. And then lastly, in the yellow area, $4.1 million uh, in the, for the general fund revenue that's generated from convention center operations. These revenues collectively fund our operation. They fund our convention and visitors bureau which is our destination marketing activities. 
They fund our convention center, which of course is where we host events, meetings, conventions, and public shows. It supports our visitor information center, which provides uh, visitor services for visitors that are coming to in advance of their arrival, getting them information or helping them while they're in the destination. And then lastly, our resort management office, uh, which you're all familiar with, it does a lot of permitting, uh, oversight of events, and then also operating many of the different uh, resort franchises that we have in the resort area. On the right side, we have our expenditures by fund. In the blue area, we have the $12.9 million for our TAP fund, which supports our advertising, promotion, and marketing activities. And then $10.3 million in the yellow. Um, I'm sorry, go back. Oh, you focused in. I'm sorry. Um, and then $10.3 million uh, for our general fund for our visitor center operations. And then green uh, area is our TIP fund that, again, supports our resort management operations. And at the bottom of the slide is our expenses by category, which shows uh, kind of a, a split about 70-30, 70% of our funding going towards our operations and our programming and 30% uh, going towards our personnel expenses. And the next chart on the top left, you see the program areas of our operation uh, by fund. Uh, in the bottom, you see the total proposed budget at $28.7 million. And on the right side of the chart, it shows a table in the pie chart format with the three largest expense areas being marketing, number one, which for a marketing organization, I think it's pretty appropriate that that's our largest portion. The second largest area is our convention center operations. And then third is our resort programming. And the next slide, please. Our proposed fiscal year 20 uh, budget compared to our fiscal year 19 budget our FTEs uh, stay the same at a little over 120 FTEs. And then our proposed budget increase is a little over $625,000. Uh, that reflects uh, no general fund increase. Matter of fact, we have about a slight decrease in a general fund of about $80,000. Our TAP fund increase of a little over $162,000 comes from projected TAP fund uh, revenue increases. And then our TIP fund increase of $542,000 includes $100,000 that was proposed for a new local marketing campaign to try to generate more activity for locals coming into the resort area to support uh, the resort area activities on a year-round basis, and $215,000 for Eastern Sports Management for the operating fees for our new uh, sports center per our operating agreement with them, and then $250,000 for city support for what we're going to be experiencing this weekend with a Something in the Water Festival. Uh, obviously very excited about uh, this weekend. And next slide. We look at some of our highlights and issues. And speaking of the Sports Center, we're very excited uh, to see the Sports Center coming out of the ground. Here you see on this picture, the top picture is the current, as a couple of days ago, with the current state of the construction of that facility. And it's really nice to see that it actually looks like the architectural rendering. So they are building what we asked them and what we expected them to build. So we're very excited about uh, this project. Our sports marketing team is very busy uh, selling the facility already. Uh, we have 11 events, brand new events for Virginia Beach that are uh, under contract right now with letters of intent that are signed. And most of these events, these new events right now are through the winter time. Uh, they're track events uh, during the time of the year when we need the business. And we have 13 other events that we're currently uh, uh, negotiating uh, with them. And we're, we're really just getting the ball rolling until we expect there's going to be a lot more of that activity coming uh, to this facility soon. Well, that's our new facility and then our existing operating facility, the Convention Center. Uh, that facility now, believe it or not, is uh, well, about 14 years old. And as an aging facility, uh, we have to invest more uh, into this facility every year as mechanical systems begin to fail. Uh, capital replacement uh, is necessary, and the facility itself is not generating the sufficient revenue to cover these additional expenses, so we're requiring a city subsidy each year to uh, meet these expenses. Uh, and as some of these current events, some of the sporting events that we have in the convention center will move to the more appropriate facility uh, for their events in the sports center, it's going to give us an opportunity to hopefully bring in more convention business that we're trying to bring into Virginia Beach. Uh, which is really the type of business that the convention center was built for, designed for, and it's also the type of business that produces the highest revenue 
uh, for the convention center. So we really need to bring more of that business in the convention center to, uh, to continue to generate the revenues we need to offset the, uh, uh, the replacement needs of that facility. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? John. What is the current, of that $6 million that was on the slide, I think it was $6 million for operations, how much of that is uh, basically, you called it subsidy, I would too, so that's correct, is subsidizing the costs that are not being covered by the revenues of the convention center? Uh, you're talking about the $6 million of the general fund, I assume. Correct. Okay. Uh, when you look at that compared to the revenues that the building is generating, there's about $2.2 .2 million uh, gap between the... Uh, uh, those expenses, the, the public support uh, from the city and the general fund and the revenues that are being generated by the facility itself. So when the revenue that you do lose, so you, I are you suggesting that the deficit grows in the current budget over the current year? Are you going to believe you have all these events? At some point in the future, the events that you talked about that are generating movie are moving out and they're moving to the sports center and that's generating revenue X, which goes away. Not all the events are, you know, just... A, a, sl a select number of events will move over. You're losing. Not right. So, and you're saying that your cost is climbing on recapitalization of this aging facility that's not even at half its life yet, I hope. Uh, but it's at 14 years, so that's rising. That's so is that on. rate rising oh, faster than the, the market revenues? Do, that's a competitive market because we're fourth tier. We're not like Vegas some, or Orlando. So we're a fourth tier down. market, so it's very price <laughs> sensitive. Yeah. So are those costs rising faster than the market pressure that you can, pricing power that you have, such that gap is going to widen? I think we will probably, because, you know, in the first, you know, 8, 10, 12 years of a new facility, you know, you have new, new systems, new equipment. Um, so we will probably, over the next several years, see our maintenance expenses continue to increase in the building. Um, the gap is going to widen. Probably for a short period of time, but our hope is that with some of these new dates, some of these, these, these sports groups that are really not appropriate for the convention center move to the sports center, that we'll be able to replace that business with convention business, which generates more revenue for the uh, convention center than the sports business does. Are we looking as a strategy, especially since we've chosen a commercial operator of the sports center, which I didn't support the project, but I do believe a commercial operator is better than a government operator. Are we looking to then as a strategy of cost of cost containment or cost improvement of going to also to a commercial operator of our convention center because it's really expensive to be paying to find benefit pension plans on all the people that operate that place when that's not the general marketplace I mean I think we got to be looking at what is our strategy because if you look at how competitive the conventions space is especially in the fourth tier level where we are at where there's not a lot of price and pressure, but your costs are rising, you're going to have to change your, your cost structure somehow. And I need you, you need to think and look at, I think, what would be the benefit. And it takes time to look at that. I don't expect that in this budget cycle. That's a thought process you have to go through. But transitioning that to a, a commercial operator uh, and looking at different other places. I know other parts of the country have commercial operators operating those, the good and the bad, but I think we as a body owe it to ourselves to understand those different business models and how sometimes the private sector, if you look at what YMCA's do, though they pay their director too much money, the, but in terms of how they operate them 24-7 practically, they get a much higher utilization and revenue generation that we've been improving with our rec centers, different model, I understand that. But I think we need to look at the model that organic government operating model, and is it a beneficial to transition to a commercial operating model like we've done with the sports center? I hope we take a look at that. We will. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. How about you. at this point we recess for about five minutes, and uh, if we can, uh, you know, get back, that would be great. In recess.
are going to engage in an update on something in the water. And we're going to let uh, our communications director jump in front of Brian and his update because we want to show you where a source of information is uh, being, uh, uh, being established off of our uh, Virginia Beach website. And I'll walk you through it, and hopefully you'll get some information from it, and then encourage you to download this to your phones. Uh, or uh, put it on your laptop. Thank you, Mr. Hansen, Mayor, members of council. We are uh, just days away. We have introducing two new tools, one to show you today. One we have just linked off of uh, vbgov.com from the homepage, and that is a, a new site that we're introducing for special events um, that will be able to provide a, a, a one-stop uh, communication hub for residents and uh, our visitors. It's primarily geared toward our residents. We don't need to, to duplicate anything that's already on either the somethinginthewater.com website or the app, but we know that our residents have some unique questions and we want to make sure that we address those. So the nice thing, day. pardon? I hear them every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, feel free to pass those on because one of the things that you will see um, on this site, so we have the information about the festival and apps that people can download. Um, we are especially going to suggest that people download the Waze app. You'll see in a minute how that is. We have a section for important information. We'll have the latest information posts here. We have closures and restrictions here. And we will also have the, the, the uh, real-time Waze app. It's already embedded here. People can come here. They can download it on their phone if they like. But it will show routes and closures and the real-time crowdsourcing that you get from the power of Waze so that if there are routes, people will be able to navigate around those. But the other feature that we've had and added here is the FAQ section. So this we will continue to expand as questions come in. So feel free if you have questions that you think will apply to a broader population of people, we're happy to add them here. And one of them in particular that we wanted to add is uh, one to receive latest updates and information. So as a result of working with ECCS, we were able to establish through VB Alert, which is a service that we provide already, a, a special alert for people who are coming in to attend the festival or residents who want specific information. So if we have a weather emergency, if we have something else happen where we want to alert as many of the uh, festival goers and our visitors as possible, you can just text SITW to, and I meant T O, <laughs> to 226787. So 226787. And you will be automatically signed up. And the nice thing is, it will automatically expire on Tuesday following the festival. So you don't have to unsubscribe to it. So it really gives you a, a nice um, uh, ability to have the features that are there. Um, we aren't going to be able to have people go in the water. You can go in the water. There's no lifeguards. But there are other uh, questions here, as well as links to the other websites that will, that will uh, provide information. And in addition, obviously, to the Something in the Water website that gives a lot of the information here, uh, the events and the activities, for example. So you'll see how things are focused throughout the festival pr footprint all weekend. But they also have it duplicated on their app, too. So more people who are coming in and just using their, their phones will be able to have the information right in there uh, in the palm of their hand. And then the getting here feature is the one where a lot of people have been looking. We've been very successful in having uh, large numbers of people already su subscribe to the festival shuttle. So we are really encouraged by that, and we are uh, posting information about that and having the information available. We are having staff uh, all weekend starting at noon on Friday through midnight on Sunday in three different locations to coordinate all of the festival information and getting information out in a, as timely a way as possible. So if there are questions or comments or things that you want to make sure that we address, we are happy to do so. Do you have questions for me? Hey, Jess. What is the analytics on the web, web, web traffic right now? So this is brand new. Okay, so, brand new. so I will be able to share that with you um, at, at 
the next briefing that we have. Do you have any idea what, what kind of traffic to Facebook Facebook's getting? Or, I mean, I guess that's their Facebook. I can, give you a, I can give you an updated report, absolutely, on actually all three. And Instagram, our Instagram feed uh, has really started to take off as well, which talks a little bit about the, the way the stories are put out there and how we're sharing the information, because we're using all of ours. The <coughs> festival is using theirs, too. They have more followers on some of their platforms. We have more followers on some of ours. And I think the real power is when we're sharing and, and adding those resources together. And we'll do that all weekend. I think just as a comment, it would be interesting that after this is all said and done, that we maybe look at a comprehensive look at how this elevated our status in terms of social media engagement and how we can capitalize that on maybe advertising some of our other features um, aside from this festival. Hopefully, it, yeah. it's a very positive and engaging light in our social media presence. We, we do see immediate bumps and followers and, and questions. Even on Instagram, where we don't usually have a lot of engagement, a lot of people asking questions, that certainly has bumped up in, in recent days as people are getting closer to it and the excitement is building. So i um, happy to provide you a full analytics report when we're at the end. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Rosemary. Well, living right in the middle of all of this, I can tell you already there is quite a bit of traffic by cars, pedestrian traffic activity, closures on the boardwalk, staff, I mean there's so much activity going on down there preparing, right. getting the, I guess, the pathways to put in the sand and building the stages and the tents and it's quite... <laughs> It's quite an undertaking to it's mount a festival of this size. Undertaking, it, it truly is. Mm -hmm. So it's. I understand there are some time lapse photography going on, so uh, we'll be able to see how it all comes together at the end. But just general people, there's a lot more people down. At this is especially for the in the middle of the week this time of the year. It's quite phenomenal. And I was with a group of mayors from the south side and peninsula this morning. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of excitement out there in the region for this. And, you know, this has the opportunity to put our entire region in a positive light. And I think Jess is right. The use of social media and everything is just going to make this whole thing far more effective and user friendly. That being said, you know, we're going to have, you know, after we're finished, you know, we're going to have that debriefing. We're going to have that critical look and see what went right, what went wrong, and we're going to make it better. But I tell you what, I, I got to commend our media and communications, our staff. There's a lot of people that are really helping putting this together in a very positive way. And that spirit of collaboration, I think, is going to make this successful. Well, and there's going to be people all around the organization, about 30 or so, who will be uh, staffing these all throughout the weekend. So um, I'll have plenty of company. OK, thank, thank you, you, Julie. Yes, Julie. Mr. Solis. Yes, sir. So uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Mr. Manager, Mr. Stiles, thank you for uh, having us here for another uh, weekly update, uh, our last week weekly update before the festival. Um, this one will focus on a brief uh, overview of some um, new information on the festival program and what we're doing to support it on a uh, staff perspective. Then we're really going to focus on public safety with the fire department, um, EMS, and emergency management uh, following suit, and we'll stand by for any questions and um, you might have afterwards. So um, that's our overview we're just talking about. Going to kind of highlight um, updated festival footprint um, here. Uh, everything colored in the circles are basically activations. Um, just to piggyback on what Julie was saying earlier about getting here uh, and the transportation options. One that I would like to highlight, aside from the park and ride at the amphitheater, is for the first time uh, for any event in Virginia Beach that I'm aware of, we have um, a regional shuttle option, and that's available from the festival organizers, and that is for Hampton, Chesapeake, um, Portsmouth, um, Norfolk, um, Suffolk. You can take a coach bus uh, from there to and from those park and ride locations. Um, it's, it's through the festival website. And it, it drops you off at the convention center and you go back home that way. The park and ride of the amphitheater, we call that our local park and ride. That's kind of a local uh, to and from shuttle that runs throughout the day. But this, this other one, this, um, this shuttle is very unique and we hope that folks take advantage of it because today's the last day to sign up for that because then they have to develop their staffing plans from there and begin to roll it out on, on Friday. So I just want to give that plug. 
while it's still live uh, today as an option. And that includes options from Richmond, <coughs> Durham, uh, North Carolina, Baltimore, and D.C. as well that folks can come down on a daily basis, um, uh, 2 in the morning, 2 in the evening. So, in any case, uh, the main change from here is that um, there was a crap to vote activation on the top of the peer shops um, that um, what they chose to do instead with that civic engagement opportunity, and that is educating young people and uh, about the importance of voting and <coughs> teaching them how to register to vote. They're going to do that along the boardwalk within the convention center um, um, instead. They're going to be kind of out and about um, and, and at the convention center uh, instead on that. If you have been around the resort area, you see that the art walk is already taking place, and the corporate sponsor with that is American Express is backing that art walk. And so that started um, really late last week, uh, I believe Thursday, and you'll see new murals on walls. There were nine sites, uh, including the uh, MOCA as well. And um, you're, you're familiar with the footprint. I've gone over it before, but um, a lot more detail has come out about the convention center, which I'm going to touch on. So the venue map, this is, we call it kind of a rendered version. Uh, some people call it a cartoon version, but this is of the main activity at the beach stage. Um, the beach stage itself is at 4th and a half Street, and it will go all the way to the main entrance at 10th Street. Um, they are starting to assemble Cause, which is a five and a half story inflatable um, piece of art. And um, the infrastructure is in place to start to accommodate that. Um, you start to see all the vendor uh, tents are up now and the build out it, with the stage and some of the other infrastructure um, is, is well in place. So um, all of the major activations associated with something in the water LLC have been <laughs> permitted. Um, the ones kind of went over last week. And again, the activations are well underway. One of the more interesting ones is Sony at 19th Street. You can see that stage with Sony uh, at the top of it, but also the geodesic dome that will have a 4D virtual reality type of experience uh, in it. And that's well underway, and it's built out. Uh, the transportation control plan is, is really being fi finalized in terms of the, the queuing of the buses at uh, between 10th Street and 5th Street on how folks will uh, depart periodically throughout the day uh, when they're using the shuttle, but particularly at the end of the night. And um, that <coughs> traffic control plan extends all the way uh, to and from the amphitheater. So there's a series of traffic control devices that are in place um, associated with that movement of those shuttles, as well as some of the um, closures <laughs> and the enforcement of the residential um, parking permit program um, that will be enforced 24 hours a day. So if you have questions about res uh, restaurant employees, uh, residents or visitors, um, and the RPP, that will be in effect. It's about 4,000 parallel parking spaces, and um, those spaces will be available for folks to, to park. Um, we've had numerous um, meetings and briefings with um, all kinds of business and civic associations. I know it's never enough, but, but we have been busy um, at those various um, locations and, and groups. So these are, this is just an example of some of the, um, and, and your itinerary was included in, in your Friday package in terms of what's publicly available right now. Um, this is some of the conversations, as they're calling them, um, at the convention center. They range everything from um, religious uh, talks to um, Deepak Chopra, who is a kind of a meditation type of uh, expert, um, to uh, music. You have the president of Sony ATV, basically Sony Music, that will be there um, as a speaker, the president of Epic Records as well. Um, and um, actually, um, Pharrell Williams and, and some of the local talent from here will be broadcasting their, um, they have a talk show that's at 1 to 2 p.m. on Friday. Uh, they'll be broadcasting out of the convention center. So, um, Definitely a very robust uh, slate of activities at the Convention Center as well. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Chief Hutchison here with uh, an overview of what the fire department's doing to prepare. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. Um, just a quick quick overview. Uh, as you see here, uh, we're, we're represented in a couple different areas. Operations is obviously the, the big part. Um, but the Fire Prevention Bureau has been... Uh, very active in the permitting, and they'll be there uh, throughout the throughout the weekend, making sure that we keep everything safe with the tents and the, anything cooking, anything like that. So they'll be handling. They'll be very busy with the occupancy loads the whole the whole weekend. Um, and then obviously we were very collaborative as always with our partners, uh, EMS, police, and uh, emergency management. So we'll be working working right alongside of everybody like we always do. This is how many we have assigned each day. 
116 roughly now. We're up to uh, pretty much an entire shift for us is where we're getting to. Uh, the command staff, the quick breakdown is 16. That's spread out over the, the EOC, the second precinct, and with the, uh, the company there. So uh, operations, 46. Fire prevention and operations, obviously, it's 20 in fire prevention, but really on this one, we're kind of all operate. They're working in the field, making sure everything's happening safe, like I said, with the permitting and then the numbers. Assigned to other agencies, that's it's quite a bit as far as the, the JHAT. That's the Joint Hazard Assessment Team. They'll be working. That's your hazmat guys, gals working along with PD and uh, other groups, making sure that uh, we keep the boardwalk safe for our visitors. Um, ECCS, we have somebody upstairs with 911 making sure the calls are coming in and handled and going into what we would consider is the box, you know, what's happening in the box and out of the box because we still have the rest of the city to, to take care of. The EOC, we have three people helping helping Aaron's crew with logistics, so that's uh, very robust. That's a lot going on for those three people, keeping everybody, uh, assisting with all the, the needs of everybody. Um, and then the EMS liaison is one. Assistance, we do have assistance for the first time uh, from outside. We, we work very well with our sister cities, but uh, Chesapeake Fire Department, we have four fire marshals from them, as well as eight coming down from the state to assist us. Uh, just because of the number of hours, we couldn't work everybody from 8 to 4 in the morning and back, you know, so we asked for some assistance, and they, they uh, gladly obliged, and we're, we're grateful for that. Hampton Roads Incident Management Team, we've got two working in the EOC again to help bolster that. And then FEMA, just we wanted to put this in here. We do, we have pulled out some of our FEMA cash, and at the training center, we are setting up tents that can hold 75 uh, people if, if, if we de team determine it necessary for somebody to catch a few winks if they need it. So that's really it for me. I, I have uh, I have a lot, another breakdown as far as where everybody is, but I'll wait till after to see if anybody's got any questions. Okay. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in terms of EMS, uh, personnel, equipment, resources, this is, is going to be the biggest deployment we've ever had uh, for, for an event or, or an incident, for that matter. Um, we'll we'll kind of walk you from the inside out. At the concert venue, we've got teams that will actually be inside there, walking teams uh, within from the stage all through the sand area. They'll be backed up by a, a field hospital at 8th Street that's uh, being provided by Terra Virginia Beach General Hospital. A couple of ambulances there. Throughout the whole resort area, we, we do our, our, what I call our, our festival model, where we've got teams of EMTs on bicycles and also uh, uh, golf cart type uh, or ATV vehicles that can transport patients. And so we've got folks uh, all up and down the resort area, then backed up by an ambulance, uh, collection of ambulances at the rescue squad. So if something happens, the patient will either get taken to that field hospital or will be brought out of the festival area to be picked up by, a, by an ambulance to take them off to uh, Beach Journal or other destinations. And meanwhile, then the rest of the city, a large command and control structure, and then we're, we're fully staffed out in the field. So um, minimum 75 people at, at each shift. Uh, what's pretty exciting about this is the majority of those folks are, of course, volunteers, and this is this function, whether pedaling a bicycle, driving ATV, or walking on the beach, this is above and beyond what their normal monthly ambulance duties are. So this is a, a huge commitment on the part of our rescue squads, um, and but we're, we're ready and excited. Appreciate right. that effort. Thank you. So for my office, our, our biggest lift is, is making sure we have everybody's plan and pulling all those together. The Emergency Operations Center will be open Friday through Sunday. Um, at the second precinct, we will have the command post. Uh, and down in the Rudy Loop is the festival branch. We will have representatives there at the festival branch, at the command post, and at the EOC. Um, our biggest lift right now is, is, is putting the event action plan together and getting all the last details so we have the documentation. Uh, today was our Technology Tuesday, um, and we've gone through the EOC from front to back, top to bottom, to make sure uh, radios, uh, computers, videos, everything is working. The biggest 
biggest thing for the EOC is the camera system. So we have access to not only the cameras that we have at the oceanfront traffic cameras, uh, convention center cameras, but all of our drones and uh, helicopter feeds will also be able to be accessed in that. And any cameras that the production companies are installing down at the oceanfront, we will be able to have access to those. So the EOC is going to provide the most situational awareness because we'll have the ability to have the eyes on the whole uh, box, as we're referring to. Um, but definite link commu of communications between the uh, EOC and command post and EOC and uh, festival branch. Um, we are providing, I am bringing in emergency manager support because same thing, can't work from 8 in the morning till 4 in the morning. So uh, Chesapeake is providing support. We have a representative from the Coast Guard that we've worked with in past events who's coming out to support, uh, as well as a couple others from the, some, from the surrounding area with additional um, assistance from the Hampton Roads Incident Manager management team. So we're getting everything together. We provided more training today on uh, Web EOC, which is our crisis management uh, system. And then our, our big lift after the event will be that after action report uh, and pulling all of that information together from across the city and across the departments um, and identifying our, our lessons learned and our areas for improvement as we look at this festival for next year. So thank you. Yeah, John. Are we... Are we leasing temporary cloud storage to, during the course of the event, to store all the live, the live feed off of our, our cameras? So we're using our Genetech system that we already have in place and already supports the, the cameras across the city. Do you have enough video storage, video take up a lot so The traffic storage. cameras don't, aren't stored video. Oh, we don't store that. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, convention center has their own storage in the oceanfront. Police cameras have their storage. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Thank you. Anything else? Brian? If anybody else has any questions, we're standing by. Jim Wood. Yes, sir. Uh, this question for Ed. Um, I, I see on here you have lifeguard marine services, but are, it's, it's just going to be roving lifeguards. Yes, You're yes not sir. They're have just the, uh, the event organizers, just that many people on the beach asked us, uh, are working for Jimmy's Life Saving Service to put a couple guards out there roving for the weekend. So it will not be the normal staffing you're going to see in a week. A in week from now, you're going to see a lot more, and yeah. just in the festival area, yes, sir. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll have our, our boat out there um, and, you know, on patrol in the area. We expect a lot of boaters in the area. So. We're, also, we're also putting the same complement at Sandbridge. Not no lifeguards out in stands, but we will have a couple of ATVs on Sandbridge on the beach during the same time period, just because we know that Sandbridge is sold out. Okay. Just yeah. Brian, if you yes, sir. have this, I'm, I'm curious. Um, do, do you have a sense of where people are staying uh, with this? Because I keep hearing these ads saying you know, sign your house up for Airbnb, <laughs> and I've seen a couple of houses in my neighborhood on the list, and I'm just curious. Do, do we have a sense of that at all? It's it's difficult to say uh, who's staying. For what purpose? But uh, for the most part, um, anywhere uh, in Hampton Roads that has um, a vacancy, whether it be um, hotel, uh, Airbnb, or campsites, um, are getting well consumed. And um, it's difficult to say if it's to what extent for the festival, but we believe it is. So in order to help validate that, we are uh, working with Old Dominion University, uh, like we mentioned uh, last week, to uh, accomplish that um, economic impact analysis, which includes a survey, which uh, asked them, you know, asked them uh, where they stayed, among other things, and if they came here for the festival, among um, a dozen other questions uh, to try to capture uh, while we had their attention. So um, we should know that better after the event. Huh? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Rosemary. Well, talking about the Airbnbs, I mean, you know, we spent three years working on this issue, and yes. they're supposed to be registered to be able to utilize Airbnb. Is there? Then we made it not effective until November, so. Then, no, they still have to be registered. The part that was November was the, all the rules and regulations. Yeah. The regulations but, the, and the, but to be registered, to they, right. we, we did make that effective before. The following yeah, rules. So, I don't know if we're looking at people all of a sudden utilizing Airbnb and they're not being registered. I'm 
sure it's happening. <laughs> I'm sure it's supposed to be rich. I think one of the things we looked at as well was 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 enforcement. Was how we we only had four enforcement officers for the entire city. So that's another thing as well. Well, it's so. just something to. Yeah, th you know, this is something we can discuss as an after-action report to, uh, you know, yeah, it's going to happen. We have coordinated with, with Bill. Um, we, we've talked with Airbnb leadership and communicated what the local rules are and, and encouraged them to convey that as well. We also had, a, at one time, a release that went to the media about the fact that you do need to register and that if you want to continue doing that, then you'll need a conditional use permit. Um, what we did not do is to go so far as to be... Uh, provide, which was requested, a, a satellite registration, for example, because we didn't understanding that we're in this in-between stage, but uh, we have we have uh, broadcast that, that you need to register. Okay. Okay, Jess. Just out of curiosity, do we know how many new Airbnbs have registered because of this event? No, I think you're not. I will inquire of the I'm just, I'm of just the curious if yeah. maybe it wasn't, you know, I, I, I've been getting a lot of calls about it, and I think that Maybe it's not as big of an impact as, you know, we, it may feel. And I think it would be helpful to know if, you know, people are actually doing it. I think, I mean, I, I, a significant amount of my neighbors have come to me and asked, hey, should I do this? And I said, I don't know. I don't know if I would do it, but you do you. So I, I'm just curious if maybe, I would like to know how many people actually followed through with okay. doing it. Okay. If I, the, the pricing structure on Airbnb is really high it so the it's hotel structure prices oh really i know i know i know and it's it's following it's not a bargain <clears throat> to do that and so the, the, that's just what leads me to believe if if it's people pay a thousand dollars for for a house there could be more than just a couple people in there See how many people are putting tents in yards I think um, I think we're, we're going to learn a, a extremely a lot mm -hmm. after this festival, and obviously there's there's so much more to learn. So all the questions we have, I think we sh we should write them down, and then after you know we have our our uh, debrief of this weekend, yeah. we'll be able to answer a lot of those questions and put in safeguards to mitigate some of the concerns we do have yeah. and, and learn from them. One of the thing about festivals that people reminisce about after or some overcoming the logistics of it and you know like i said even with woodstock you know people you know were out in the mud and you know there were limited toilet facilities but people just grasped on to the fact that this was a fat festival work go worth going to okay i was in the marine corps sir <laughs> 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 all, right. all right okay aaron thank you yeah. aaron did you tip, give them the bad news yeah, so um, just, just <laughs> I, I don't like to be a bearer of bear bad news, but Lewis and I, we, we didn't make the cut for the, for the murals and the paintings. And the <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. 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 We didn't make Very that cut. So. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> next year. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, if we can get through this expeditiously, Mrs. Yes. Uh, uh, Mrs. Henley needs a couple minutes at the end. Oh. Okay, so okay. go like the wind. Go like the wind. All right, so planning items upcoming. How many items? About 11. 11 items. Let's see. Uh, abbreviated. They're not here to film the planning items? Okay, thank you. Talk. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be taking you through the planning items to be considered by the council at your May 7th and May 21st city council meetings. For May 7th, we have six items for your consideration. First item is a request for a conditional use permit for a tattoo parlor within the existing salon in a shopping center on Laskin Road. This tattoo parlor will be specializing in permanent makeup, otherwise known as microblading. There will be one employee, typical hours of operation, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Wednesday through Saturday. No exterior changes are proposed to the building or signage. Okay, Jim Ward. Since it's in my district, I'll ask a question we always yes, sir. ask. When can we fix this so they don't come back? <laughs> it's tattooing. It, it's, the, it's the same answer. It's, it's still the same process, so I, I, we're not familiar with a way to treat it differently. We can't yes. categorize it as microblading? 
It's the same. It's the same physical process. Is the problem? What is, what is, per, what, what is permanent makeup and for money? Tattoo it's tattooing. Oh, so it's, it's, it's arching of the eyebrow. Well, it's other things too. Well, it's not arching. You're not always surprised. You know. <laughs> 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 you can eat that, all kinds of things. Put all on. right, let's move forward. <laughs> what is it? What is it? You know, I don't know. I'll try it. Okay. okay. Next, next item is a request for a conditional use permit for a family daycare in the Huntington Estates neighborhood. Applicants proposing to care for up to 12 children within a single family dwelling. Applicant has over 25 years of experience. Typical hours of operation, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Next item is a conditional use permit for Strayer University in the town center. University is relocating to a new location in the town center just across the street from their current location, which is right above the Gordon Biersch restaurant. The majority of the 600 students enrolled in classes at the university are online. Only 60 to 90 students are actually on site at any one time. University employs approximately 10 full-time and part-time employees. Next item is another tattoo parlor for microblading. This one again is within an existing salon in the Red Mill shopping area. There will be one employee, and the typical hours of operation will follow those of the existing salon. No exterior changes are proposed to the building or to the existing signage. Next item is hopefully the final tattoo parlor within a new building salon on Pembroke Lake Circle. This too is located or will be within a proposed beauty salon within an existing commercial building. Typical hours will follow that of the proposed salon. No exterior changes to the building other than a new sign. There was one speaker at the Planning Commission who thought this was a regular tattoo parlor, but upon learning that it was limited to microblading, they withdrew their opposition. Next item, this is the final item for your May 7th agenda, are conditional use permits for an assembly use and open air market located at the historic Kellum House on Princess Anne Road. The assembly use is proposed to allow hosting of events, including reunions, weddings, retreats. The open air market is proposed to permit food trucks for those events and for a once a month craft farmers market. The assembly use will utilize temporary tents and restroom trailers. No food will be prepared in the home. Instead, caterers and food trucks will provide food, which is typically prepared offsite prior to service. Approximately 172 on-site parking spaces will be provided. Vehicle access will be from the existing entrance on Princess Anne Road, which will be improved to commercial standards. There was one speaker at the Planning Commission meeting in support of the application. I have a question. Yes, sir. On the parking? Yes, sir. I assume that they're not, they're just using the They're the just ground, using the lawn areas. The lawn Correct. areas right. as Parking. Correct. And actually make any additional that's that's right. Okay. And we have a condition in the report that says that in the event it rains and the ground becomes worn away, they need to repair it. Okay. That's good. I just want to make sure that for May 21st, we have six items for your consideration. First item is a street closure in the Croatan neighborhood. Property owner is seeking to close half of the 15-foot wide alley adjacent to the rear lot line of their property. The applicant intends to incorporate the alley into their lot and develop the property with a single family home. Next item are conditional use permits for an assembly use and outdoor recreation facility in connection with an existing restaurant in a shopping center on Lynn Haven Drive. The assembly use is proposed to hold special events such as large gatherings, weddings, and outdoor bands. The outdoor recreation facility will permit outdoor activities such as bocce ball and cornhole. The shopping center contains currently 245 parking spaces. A minimum of 206 parking spaces are required for the shopping center, including the proposed assembly use. Through a shared parking agreements with two neighboring uses, an additional 60 parking spaces would be available for larger events. In response to concerns raised at the planning meeting about noise, the Planning Commission recommends a modification to prohibit outdoor amplified music after 10 p.m. There was a concern because they're on the water that noise will carry across the water 
And in fact, Commissioner Whitney Graham lives right across the water and while in support of this application noted that perhaps the hours should be moderated a little bit to control that amplified music. Next item is a 711. This is a conditional rezoning request from the B1 Neighborhood Business District to conditional B2 Community Business District and a conditional use permit for an automobile service station at the corner of Princess Anne Road and Parliament Drive. The site is currently developed with a vacant retail building which was previously occupied by a drugstore and its associated parking. The proposed use will be a convenience store with fuel pumps. The convenience store will have contemporary architecture. 20 parking spaces are proposed, exceeding the 17 spaces required. The Planning Commission, noting the adjacency to a residential neighborhood on the north side, recommended doubling the screening along that side of the property with a double row of trees and shrubs as well as a fence, as well as limiting the hours of servicing for the dumpster. Uh, yeah, Jeff. Yes. On the 7-Eleven application. Yes. Up yes, I'm sorry. Uh, the screening is going to be only on the the uh, on the sides where there's a the can't speak the residential lot. Correct. That's right. And then the is the developer planning on tearing down the existing building? Yes. So the existing building. In fact, there's a substantial buffer today in this area. <laughs> right. And they'll, they'll actually be expanding that buffer. So the green area that you'll have tomorrow is, is greater than what you have today. And then in addition to that, the screening along the property line adjacent to the residences would be double what we would normally see. So we'd see twice as many trees and shrubs and a fence. What was turnout at planning on this? Uh, there's no opposition. There's no opposition. No. Okay. And I'm assuming that they've met with the adjoining civic leaders. Yes. Yes, they did. Yeah. Um, that was one of the... I had gotten a few calls on this when this application was first introduced. I know David Weiner has worked really hard right. with the developer reaching out to the community to try to get consensus. So, I mean, it sounds like that's... that's yes. For the most part. I think so, yes. We met early with the applicant. They came in and we highlighted our concerns, not so much concerns, but educating them on the need to get out, to speak to the community, and to uh, improve the site in terms of the buffer area. And I think they followed through on that. All right, well, uh, and we'll, of course, we'll have to verbatim. In our sure, package. absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Yep. So the next item is uh, a modification of conditions for a craft brewery located on Laskin Road. The property was approved for a conditional use permit for a craft brewery back in 2015. At that time, food preparation and service was prohibited by the zoning ordinance when located within a brewery. The zoning ordinance now permits food preparation and service, and the proposed modification of conditions will help to clarify the record and incorporate food preparation and service as part of this brewery. No other changes are proposed to the use, no changes to hours of operation employees, the building, or signage. The next item is a conditional yeah. rezone. Have, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I I'm sorry. Yep. We're trying to move through this. Yes, the breweries and the conditional use. How many? I mean, this might be a question you yeah. get back. How many were conditionally zoned with no with prohibited uh, food being made? In you know, there? I don't know, but we'll. I would just be interested yeah. to know because in my personal visits to a lot of the local breweries in the city, I've noticed most of them are starting to serve food in some capacity, and I'm right. wondering if they're inadvertently out of compliance, and if there's a way to broad brush them into compliance? There yeah. are very few. Okay. Uh, we learned early on in the process that food service uh, was a necessary thing for craft breweries. This is one of two that I know off the top of my head. And we're and working to get the other one in? The other one currently does not serve okay. food, but we have reached out to them and said, if you do, please see us to modify. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Next item is uh, an application for conditional rezoning from the AG2 Agricultural District to conditional O2 Office District for city-owned land located at the corner of Princess Anne Boulevard and Winterberry Lane. The applicant proposes to purchase this land and develop it with a three-story office building with vehicle access from Winterberry Lane only. The building will have contemporary architecture featuring a primarily glass facade, category four screening, which is about six to eight feet at time of planting, but 30 feet at maturity, is proposed along the northern property line adjacent to the residential neighborhood. 
A shared parking agreement has been proposed and approved by our zoning administrator, which will allow the use of the adjacent restaurant property, which is owned by the applicant for meeting up the deficit in parking. Opposition concerns raised at the Planning Commission included traffic, primarily traffic exiting the property and traveling up Winterberry Lane into their residential neighborhood. The applicant uh, suggested and is following through on a revision to their proffer agreement to basically create a pork chop arrangement at their exit such that vehicles will be forced to exit to the right onto Winterberry Lane and not travel to the north into the residential neighborhood. The last item for you is Piney Grove Baptist Church, and Kevin will provide an update. <laughs> yes, uh, make this as quick as you remember. In January, this item came. Okay, uh, okay. Could, uh, could we defer uh, this uh, thing? Uh, Mrs. Henley's got to get a, uh, a something in quick, if we can. Yes, as important as that is, I need to talk about it. something yeah. that happened. If we do, we just this. need a couple minutes, so if we could just I hold off. I would that. be happy at. Next earliest convenience. To okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, I had asked for a few minutes. Uh, if this had occurred in the rest of the city last weekend, it would have been first on the agenda, not crammed in the last couple of minutes. We had an experience over the weekend that is severe and it's happening more and more. It's intense. It's not something that's going to be happening possibly in 30 or 40 years. It's happening now with a lot of regularity. And I really really need to be able to tell you something about wind tides and what this whole phenomenon involves. Um, we had severe storms Friday night. Saturday morning, the rest of the city was going back its business as normal. The southern part of the city was crippled, not because of the rain. We were crippled before a drop of rain fell on Friday. The flooding started Thursday and Friday just with strong southerly winds. It's the winds blowing the Currituck Sound up and the Currituck Sound trying its daggondest to get to the Atlantic Ocean, but there's no outlet to the Atlantic Ocean. And so it has to stay up here until the wind shifts, which didn't happen until Sunday. So we had one church in particular. I sat two rows behind the pastor Sunday morning because he couldn't be in his church. It was flooded. We've really got to understand what this is all about. And it's not something that has happened forever. The best source to tell us the way it was is William Byrd's diary. William Byrd led the Virginia expedition in 1728, which set the state line. And fortunately, he was a wonderful writer who never expected this to be printed, but he kept his diary. And when you read in 1728 what the situation was, uh, March 5th, when they arrived at the old Corotuck Inlet to set the boundary, and he talks about how that inlet was being shoaled in, but another inlet had opened five miles south where the ships were coming in. This is what happened regularly all along the coast inlets opened and inlets closed. It happened that the Kortuk, the original Kortuk Inlet, which brought the first settlers in the 1600s, began to close in a storm in 1713. And by 1728, it was almost shoaled in. But another inlet had opened, which served that area to bring the ships in for another century. And it was a storm in about 1830 that caused that that inlet to close. But these were navigable inlets all along the coast. Other inlets would open and they would close, and they would open and they would close. But then there were also washovers. And a wonderful source that I've tried everybody I could think of who would read this gave them this report from Mr. Harold Waterfield, uh, who was a very credible engineer uh, with the Corps of Engineers who happened to grow up on Back Bay and knew it backwards and forwards. And so credible of an engineer that the Corps of Engineers building in Norfolk is named the Waterfield Building. So I think what he wrote here has a lot of credibility. He was particularly concerned when he wrote this in 1951 about Back Bay. All of these problems with Back Bay didn't just start. 
they have been there. And his concern or his theory had to do with the loss of the SAVs. But what he does is he documents not only all of this historical background going back to Byrd's diary and other things that occurred throughout the, the centuries, but particularly the establishment of the sand fences along the, the, the sand spit, which the state had installed by about 1925 to 1930. And by putting in the sand fences and creating the sand dunes, it closed off all of the overwashes and the potential for any inlets to open and close. And those sand fences were again reinforced by the CCC in uh, the late 1930s. And so what we have now, what we originally had were inlets opening and closing and wa overwashes occurring. But now we have a situation where it's completely closed off. And so when this water is blown in from the Currituck Sound, it's trapped. It can't get to the ocean until the wind shifts and it blows it back down to the Oregon Inlet. And as long as this situation happens, and it's happening much more frequently with the changes in the weather, uh, this, is, this is going to occur. It's not a rain event, it's a wind event. And when it's combined with extremely heavy wind or rain, we didn't have extremely heavy rain Friday night. We had a little under three inches, which is a lot of rain, but it could accommodate that. But if it had been a six or a seven inch or 10 inch rain, like some of those have occurred, and the waters were up and all that rain came, it would have really been disastrous. We really need to see what can be done about this situation. And I know Dewberry has looked at creating an inlet and, and probably with the sea level rise, that's maybe probably not an option because inlets would close and open and open and close and you'd never keep it open and everything else. Uh, Mr. Waterfield has suggested creating an overwash at some place. Of course, he was looking for more salinity to be able to create the SAV uh, situation better. Uh, I'm just talking so fast, I know you're not understanding all of this, but I'm just telling you there's a whole lot here that we really need to look at. We need to address how we can create an a, 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 a escape valve for that water to get back to the ocean instead of just staying up here for days and even weeks. Um, I, I, whatever there might be as possibilities. I, I know, I think somebody has told me how much the pumps in New England, uh, uh, New Orleans cost. Maybe something of that nature has to be done. But we really need to look at this question and it's an entirely separate issue from rain and stormwater. Digging a ditch only lets this water come up faster. So you've got something that's working against the other. And what we are having a lot of trouble understanding are having people understand that there's different situations that have different issues and have to be handled a lot differently. And I'm, I'm just telling you, asking you to make certain that we can really be talking about this now. And when we get into this budget, we can't wait 10 or 12 years to start talking about this right. kind of issue. At this point, Mr. Hansen, will you please, you know, at the behest of council, you know, include this, you know, as a priority in the strategies going forward and as part of our discussion. I know it's probably going to, yeah, it, this, is a, this is of major, major importance. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, if we can adjourn to outside, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.